present i know it's an effort to come nowadays to uh in-person events it feels a bit strange i don't think i'm the only one who feels that way uh it's kind of an experiment as well for us to do it for the first time as hybrid so let's just see how we can do it better and, and as much profitable as possible for everyone who, who is coming but also for those of you who are online so Welcome, uh, my name is Jacques Josua. I manage this organization called the IO Foundation. We are a global nonprofit uh, advocating for data-centric digital rights. And what that really means in a very um, easy way to put it is the utopian attempt of trying to convince governments that when they issue a policy that has to do with public consumption technology, that it doesn't only come with a piece of paper with pretty, pretty words as how it should be uh, uh, implemented, but also a technical standard for the actual implementation. In other words, if I am expecting the industry to do a certain behavior, I should be able to not only tell them what are the margins of those behavior from an implementation perspective so that they know exactly what is expected from them, but also to be able to develop the tools to verify that compliance, which is right now one of the main problems that we're having in, in public consumption technology. So. Um, Today we are, quote unquote, celebrating Data Privacy Day. Um, Data Privacy Day has interestingly become Data Privacy Week. Uh, it's been celebrated for uh, quite a number of years, uh, if memory um, serves me well, at least 10 years. And, and at the IO Foundation, we celebrate at least um, two or three times, but the, the, the last year we couldn't because of the, uh, of the pandemic. Um, 
it essentially is an attempt of raising awareness on the element of privacy in technology. Uh, there's over 200 uh, organizations around the world uh, doing activities specifically today, but they've been running them for, for pretty much um, all over the week. Um, we are taking today the opportunity of uh, celebrating DPD uh, 2022 and using it as well as the opening um, uh, event for our TikTok platform, which I will be discussing right now. And we will look at it not only from a um, usual perspective of, you know, you have to be protecting yourself as a user, et cetera, et cetera. We try to have a twist uh, in, in our particular event on business and human rights in tech. So how do we mix both and how we're going to be trying to achieve those kind of protections and privacy through the application of the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, specifically on the tech industry. So, one of the initiatives that we run in, in TIOF, and which is absolutely related to our advocacy, is that we regard programmers as technologies in general, but much more importantly, programmers, as the next generation of rights defenders. The idea here is that if we are concerned about the devices that we're using, we should be even more concerned about the people who are building those devices. But if you want to actually make sure that technology is built in the safest way that you can, well, the people who are behind designing and implementing that technology should be the first ones in the conversation. If they are outside, they will not feel at all interested or they will not even understand that they do have a role to play. And so um, we started uh, about two years ago Two, two, three years ago in 2018, more or less, we started doing uh, in-person events to try to bring programmers into our sessions in which we tweaked a little bit the syllabus. We, we, they will be learning some technical stuff that they were interested in, and we would tweak it a little bit with human rights embedded into the, uh, into the session. Then came the pandemic, and we couldn't do that anymore, so we decided to just go ballistic and uh, do it online, and not only in Malaysia, but actually um, all around the world. So for the past year, every third weekend of the month, we'll be opening our take up um, uh, space. And basically, we were running uh, sessions on capacity building that had to be with uh, uh, technology, but also with soft skills. And the idea was to um, provide an environment for programmers to slowly grow into that role. It's a very, very long uh, process type of, uh, uh, of situation. And of course, you have to be very, very patient. So, we were not only concentrating on the technical part of it, but also on the let them understand uh, business and human rights and technology, but also things such as you want them to go out and change the world kind of thing. They need to have the tools to do that, specifically soft skills. I mean, you don't have that many computer science faculties that give you public speaking uh, abilities, okay? And, and that's one of the reasons why they don't engage in public policy or they don't engage in certain places because they don't have the ability, they just are interested on systems, algorithms, and they're not encouraged to try to do that, that, that kind of participation. So um, we decided that for um, 2022, we wanted to open the, the space as a 24 hours um, um, community for people to, to come in, essentially because while weekends work very well, because we've run that for 48 hours, so all the time zones around the world could actually participate, it was a bit taxing and it was difficult for certain people to be able to accommodate just a weekend. Specifically, it came to a point where the pandemic was already for so long and people uh, uh, um, locked down in their places that the weekends they wanted to use it for something else, which makes a lot of sense. So we decided that with this flexibility, it would allow people uh, to use the space much more. And we're using today to be able to launch it uh, officially. Now, really, the, the question, uh, kind of the lead motif of the, uh, of the space is, in what kind of world do you want to code? And that really calls to programmers, OK? So as I said, we are celebrating Data Privacy Day. And so it would be a matter of asking ourselves, uh, what the hell is privacy? And I've been giving it quite a thought as to what do we really mean by, by privacy. So, so sometimes you start having certain terms that out of common daily use, we might not necessarily remember where they came from or what was the, the actual uh, intention behind it. And I would actually translate privacy as the attempt to try to not get from me information that can be weaponized against myself. And, you know, 
the privacy term has kind of a broad spectrum of applications depending on um, different areas of your life. But when it comes to technology, it really boils down to that. And so by not thinking about what the privacy element is about in technology, we seem to be forgetting what is it that we are trying to protect ourselves about, which is basically data extractionism and the misuse of that data. Um, I want to make a point here where there's kind of a there's, there's two confusions that I see very often when it when it comes to these kind of, of conversations. The first one is the nature of data. And sometimes I feel myself to be a broken record because I have to repeat myself over and over. But seriously, one of the main problems on the understanding of all of these issues is what the hell data is. And the current general perception, it seems to be this magical dust. Like imagine that we are in the middle earth of Lord of the Rings. You know, there's this magical dust around us and just some wizards are able to capture that magical dust and put it in a cauldron and make a formula out of it and then here comes magic. Uh, that's quite inaccurate. Um, and the reason is, let's say for instance Nabila. I want to try to get Nabila to buy a vacuum cleaner that I just released into the market. It's super flashy and I'm pretty sure she's going to be interested into it. The thing is I'm not going to be able to target her unless I get information that is sufficiently contextualized so that I know it's her. If the context is missing, I don't know who I'm targeting. And I don't know how to explore that information in order to try to achieve that commercial transaction. So no data is ever valuable unless it's sufficiently contextualized for the purpose of the use of that data. Now the moment that you do that, it turns out that you have linked that data to that person. If I ever decontextualize again, if I detach it from that person, I get no value. The conclusion is that we are our data, and the data is us. There is no actual separation. And the moment that you start saying that the data that represents you is just as part of you as your own limbs, you start looking at it a little bit different. You might be caring a little bit more, as in you would probably care about what happens to your clones. So the question is why are we not caring about what happens with the data that represents us, which is essentially a digital clone. So when you already have the part of the data, then you have to think about exactly what digital systems are composed about. So very simple, data and algorithms in a very broad spectrum. Even when you talk about hardware, in, in essence, you're looking into how that hardware is going to, be, is going to behave, and you can model that as an algorithm. That's, that's, that's easy to see. Now, there is this element on the privacy where we think, oh, I have to keep the data private to myself. Well, it really depends on the, on the case scenario, and I can give you one, one uh, um, piece of example where sharing data becomes a public interest. But beyond that, it really is much more a matter of the algorithm. And what do I mean by that? Let's say again, maybe I'm sorry to, give, to take you as an example all the time. Let's say, for instance, that I know a secret from Nabila that could jeopardize her working position. Okay? Is Nabila at risk only because I know the information? No. It depends on what I'm going to do with the information. If I decide to keep the secret for myself, she's in no danger whatsoever. So the data itself is not the one that causes the problem, it's what we act upon the data that can potentially create a problem. And so a very good example for specifically the Malaysian context as to how information once shared might be very important and, and have public um, utility, Malaysia is one of the few places in the world that I know of that provides antiretroviral anti treatment for life or HIV patients, for HIV um, um, patients, uh, residents at least, as in you have to be Malaysian for that, but okay. Well, that's great. Now, from a logistics perspective, I need to know where the hell those people are inside Malaysia territory so that I can supply the proper hospitals. If by any chance there are more of them in Johor, I'm going to have to be shifting my logistics so that there's more antiretrovirals in the Johor hospitals than in the KL one, for instance. That is a good thing. Now, the thing is, 
the responsibility on how the data is used is another conversation altogether. All and you don't need to identify the specific subject, but you need to identify the specific region. Okay? So, again, the data itself is not really the problem. What you do about the data, the algorithm you're going to be applying matters. All of this is in the context of, so what can we do? Okay. Well, we could do what we've been doing for the past 20 years, basically nothing. So we just keep having a lot of conversations about privacy. We can keep having about, uh, you know, a lot of personal training, a lot of digital hygiene, smartest thing ever. You have to learn how to protect yourself. You have to learn how to install uh, um, uh, anti-malware. You have to know, you have to read this huge terms and conditions from a, a website where you want to be publishing things and figure out how much information is going to be taken out of you. Yeah, yeah, that, that's going to work. But hear me out. How about we actually design a technology so that all the things that are supposed to be protecting us by law because they are in the jurisdiction, because there is an actual regulation on that, are already implemented in the technology that we're using so I don't have to worry myself about whether it is compliant or not. Does that sound like a crazy idea? It turns out that's exactly what we do in any single other industry. Take the car industry, Malaysia, you know, pretty big industry for automobiles. Perodua, Proton, they know exactly the kind of cars that they can build because the government doesn't only issue one specific regulation say, oh, cars have to be safe. And they should have three airbags minimum and one seatbelt. Okay. That's not the only thing they say. They also issue a technical document where they specif specify exactly how the seatbelt is to behave and how those airbags have to behave too. And before any of those manufacturers can put any car in the market, they have to send a prototype which gets tested. There is an agency that is tasked to test that. And they can test it because they also know the margins for those testing. They have the tools to test it. So when the car comes into the, um, um, into the market, the user, the citizen, has only the responsibility of being a responsible driver. That's it. And you can think about that with any single industry you can think of. Now, it would be great if when I buy a smartphone, my only concern is to be a responsible user and not forward stupid things on WhatsApp. You know, spread misinformation, etc., etc. But that would be my concern as a responsible citizen. But whether my data is being captured outside of my consent and do I have to concern myself? Uh -uh, that shouldn't be the case. So, one of the ways that we tried to tackle with that in the IO Foundation was to get involved in the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, and specifically for the past two years, Mariam, correct? Yeah. We've been looking into it from a um, perspective of BHR applied to the tech sector. Um, Malaysia being a signatory of the uh, um, uh, UNGPs, uh, it's been tasked to um, issue what's called a national action plan, which uh, we're going to be having a, a, a bit of an explanation later. And we've been looking into how to involve tech companies so that when they are compliant with this national action plan, some of those by design protections come into the document and they allow us to ensure a basic uh, a modicum of that protection. Anyway, so as I was uh, mentioning before, we regard programmers as the next generation of rights defenders and we believe that one of the cool things about programmers is that everywhere in the world, in every single industry, industry that you can think of, if you can actually provide them with the motivation for them to part of the solution, even just one, two percent of them, you can have a lot of stuff advanced. So I hope that you're going to be, I hope I didn't upset anyone, uh, and I hope you're going to have a, a pretty good day um, morning um, with us. By all means, ask us any question that you would like to. Uh, we are pretty excited about the panels and the workshops that we're going to be having on the, uh, during the day. And yeah, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, 
true to what you said about uh, how long we've been here, uh, Data Privacy Day, I, ju I, I just, you know, did a quick search and apparently Data Privacy Day was... Oh, hey, finally. Good morning. I didn't recognize. Um, Data Privacy Day was first celebrated uh, in 2007, apparently. And uh, so it's been 15 years. But of course, privacy as a concept. Hi, good morning. <laughs> I think uh, we can pull a chair. Yeah. Uh, so, but officially, though, um, uh, the 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 celebration itself as a day, a dedicated day on every twenty eighth of January, has been around for fifteen years, and it took us that long to get to this level of awareness. Uh, we are kind of hoping that next year, when we celebrate it again, we have a lot more substantive things to say about it. Uh, but anyway, uh, thank you so much, very much uh, uh, to John for that um, greetings. And uh, we will move to the next section, which is uh, about business and human rights in tech. Um, uh, before we go for our coffee break at 10, 10 o'clock. Can I have this? Oh, thank you. Okay, sensor, got it. Well, um, as John mentioned earlier, uh, our advocacy with the United Nations Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights has been around since 2019. And when we first uh, started it, it was, uh, it was like a blank canvas uh, because uh, the UNGP is actually applied to all the business sectors. Uh, but when it, as, as, as it is applied to the tech industry in particular, uh, there were very few resources and very few uh, uh, references that we could we could uh, look at in order to uh, advance the advocacy in this particular area. Uh, however, um, we we uh, we do realize that big tech companies like DG or uh, Microsoft, uh, they do have uh, and uh, not just an awareness, even programs for business and human rights within their uh, within their companies. Um, so our focus uh, of, of the past three years had been to engage with the government uh, because the Malaysian government had uh, announced a commitment to draw out a national action plan for business and human rights, uh, which uh, they announced it in 2019, right? 2019, and then they uh, they decided on three thematic areas uh, sometime last year, which is uh, environmental rights, labor rights, and good governance. So um, before they decided on those thematic areas, we had actually wanted to suggest to the government to have digital rights as one of the thematic areas in the National Action Plan. Uh, but also, uh, but since they have already decided on the three, uh, we uh, proposed for it to be a cross-cutting area instead. And... We pre so we presented these, we, we asked them, how can we do that? Uh, by them meaning by you, uh, the, the government division that's responsible for the National Action Plan. And then they asked us to give us reasons why should digital rights be in the National Action Plan. So we gave them these reasons. Core reason being, we are no longer just living in an analog, essentially. Every time we post a Facebook status, every time we post a tweet, Every time we give a WhatsApp message, every time there is a part of us being put into a machine to be processed and analyzed, and then that data right there that we don't have access or control over gets, you know, used and, and um, processed in ways that we don't even know most of the time. That is the problem right there. Um, so... Malaysia going through this process of digital transformation, transformation, transformation is a lot to do with like uh, upgrading from one tech to another, upgrading from non-tech to tech rather than seeing technology as a part of us. Even, I mean, I mean, sometimes I see my hairband as even technology, actually. Because technology is the way of thinking. It's not just a, it's not just a, a, a thing. It's not a phone. It's not a, it's not a, a, a laptop, okay? 
So when we switch that, that, that way of thinking, we can see that all of our human activity is already now digitalized. So digitalization here um, is somewhat disconnected with our lived reality as people uh, because we seem to, to look at the digital as separate from us. We, we, had, we don't see our digital self. Our Facebook identity, for example, is our identity. Our Google identity is our identity. Our Twitter identity is our, our identity. They are a representation of us somewhere on somebody's server, on somebody's computer. So getting that across <laughs> to, to become policy, that, is, that, was, that has always been a challenge in the past three years. And it is still a growing conversation. And that's why uh, uh, we wanted that, that panel today. The panel is all here. We wanted that panel today to discuss how do we translate all that theory and concept into actual policy for technology. Anyway, essentially, um, uh, next, please. Yeah. Essentially, since everything in our lives are now digital, it makes sense to have policies that protect those digital representations of ourselves, that protects our digital twins. Can we? Oh, right, I forgot I have the click. <laughs> All right, um, so what have we learned in the past three years? Uh, we've learned that there are certain distinctions, actually, between uh, uh, different types of uh, digital rights. And the reason why the distinction needed to be said is because it, it, it informs uh, different approaches to policy. Uh, traditional digital rights, which somewhat uh, appeared around 2016, 2017, if I'm mistaken, John, yeah, somewhere there, um, was all about how, talking about human rights in the digital space. So the digital is just a medium. Like I said, it's separate from us. As if that the digital platform is not us. It's not part of us or who we are. Uh, meanwhile, the, the, the digital rights advocacy that we do at the IO Foundation, which is data-centric digital rights, is about the rights, okay, humans or machines, um, the rights of, of ourselves and our digital selves, okay, to be implemented into the digital technologies themselves, their systems, and as well as their procedures and protocols. So it's a... Uh, do you see the difference in approach? So here with data centric digital rights, we don't have any disembodiment. There is no disembodiment between you and your data. You are your data. Whatever happens to your Twitter identity happens to you in real life, affects you in the analog. Whatever happens to your Facebook or Google or, or, or any other digital identities you have will affect you in an analog one way or another because you are the source of that data. As John mentioned earlier, I cannot do anything to you, even if I have information about you, if I cannot contextualize you in the first place. So every data that is useful is authentic data, and that, that is the one that we need to protect. So digital rights in that sense is literally digital rights, protecting that digital entity. Okay, next please. Oh. Okay, so uh, these are some of the things, they are the things that digital, uh, the traditional digital rights revolve around. Human rights as champion into the digital space. So we're talking about human rights activists going online, uh, having their own websites, having their own socials, uh, social media profiles, they're having their own um, anything, audio, video, images, whatever that they can digitize and then put online, essentially. Okay, and then it revolves around free and open access, and then we see a lot of campaigns on internet shutdowns, which are all legitimate uh, rights uh, that are being championed in digital spaces. Okay, and uh, this has been the prominent uh, type of digital rights advocacy. Whereas uh, data-centric digital rights revolve around these three main things, uh, not necessarily all of it, but this is the, these are the three which is to advocate for the necessary technical standards uh, to transparently implement digital rights and enable technologies to create better and safer tech. So, for example, how do you translate freedom of expression into a technology? 
yeah that's the that's the question that we're trying to answer essentially so because a, a concept like 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 human rights is so big and so conceptual and so abstract to be translated into something so material and meticulous as a technical standard that has a step by step you know uh, uh, detail about what to do what not to do that requires a lot of uh, a, a change in mindset also actually to know that 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 those digital representative those digital representations of ourselves that we want to protect they are protected technologically not just conceptually and then the protection and proper use of authentic data um, i can put in or inject a lot of noise into into anything really like i can put in a lot of information into something that don't make sense which is why we look at authentic data and we push for data integrity. Uh, because for the simple reason that good data leads to good decisions. It's not, um, it's, the data is not the problem. The data collection is not the problem. In fact, actually we've reached a point of no return with the, point, the, with the data that we've collected so far. <laughs> uh, honestly, to be honest, what, what, what I, I am personally interested in is protecting future data. Right, we are talking about technologies that are coming, coming, um, uh, coming soon to us. Uh, things like the metaverse or, or things like that. If, let's say, if we take the example of Cambridge Analytica, if they can have a digital profile of you based on only five thousand data points to 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 push you towards a certain political inclination, what are things like you know immersive technologies can do? to collect like millions of data points on us and what that is, you know, the potential impact of that into not just politics, but in general, everything. It doesn't even have to be uh, who you choose in elections, but also what you buy, what you, it's like, is everything even your own choice anymore? Do you even live as a human being anymore? Ma and Ma yeah. just just want to make a point about the definition of authentic data, just okay. in case you never have heard that expression. So there's a distinction to be made between authentic data and what you could call unauthentic data. In um, inauthentic, okay. Yeah. English not being my first language. Yeah. I can always use that excuse. Um, so authentic data is essentially data that really represents a specific source entity that you can trace or something that really has happened or really exists in the physical world. John, yes? uh, the camera is here. It's, it's here. fine. Yeah, well, I didn't okay. want to take the stage again. Okay. Okay, in case people want to see my pretty face again. Right, okay. So the point that I'm trying to make is that um, you can generate a piece of art with, let's say, Microsoft Paint, okay? But doesn't really, that doesn't really um, um, reflect anything on the real world that you can see or you can touch. It's still data. It still has an applicability. You can still use it. But it doesn't link to anyone or to anything. Whereas authentic data is data that is extracted or modeled outside, out of something that you can um, relate to. A person, a table, the weather, whatever it is. And the reason why there's a huge difference to be made is because authentic data has that contextual value that we were discussing before. Inauthentic data doesn't necessarily have to. Yep. And for those who may have a little bit more of a technical background, when you just buy a hard disk, the hard disk itself also comes with a series of ones and zeros that might not be interpreted directly by us, but if you just use a specific, let's say, any sequence of ones and zeros can be interpreted just in the way that you want. And you can always generate a way to make it a Picasso type of thing or a Dali type of, type of thing, if that is your wish. But does it really have any utility, any actual utility? So. That type of information that is generated, you can call it randomly, it's not really random, but okay, is to be differentiated to the one that you extract from someone and can actually have a very clear utility for whichever purposes. I just wanted to make the difference of why yep. we are using the authentic part. Yep, thank you, John. And also, another thing to note here is that and, uh, we, we wanted the protection and proper use of authentic data under a rights framework rather than an ethical framework because ethics is culturally uh, relative. So, uh, whereas rights are universal. And uh, last but not least, the ownership of data for the simple reason that you cannot give consent over something that you do not own. 
I can't consent to lending you my car if I don't own the car. Like, how do I consent to giving my data for you to use if I don't own it? <laughs> it's it, essentially that's the, the, the logic. Um, okay. All right. So uh, key concepts here uh, would be to, uh, to, to make that very small jump to look at your digital representations and your digital twins or your digital bodies. There's, there are multiple terms uh, going around in the literature, but essentially just look at them as yourself, but in a digital format. Can you imagine yourself in the metaverse, for example, walking around in an animated format meeting your favorite celebrities, accessing them in ways that you have never accessed them before. At the same time that you're doing all that, all information that is being, that is being collected from you is constantly running, constantly being collected. If we are talking about, if, if, if Cambridge Analytica only needed 5,000 data points, imagine technologies that can collect millions of data points. <laughs> You know, I mean, if 5,000 is more than enough to do that, to affect that big the, uh, an election at that scale, what can, like, can you imagine what millions of data points can do? And, uh, okay. And also the next one is, is the fact that in all of this, it, the traditional or the data-centric digital rights, Programmers and developers and technologies are the next generation of human rights defenders. Essentially, um, if we are in a pandemic, our frontliners are the doctors and the nurses and the medical professionals. If we are in a digital crisis, a digital rights crisis, a digital pandemic, who will be our frontliners if not our technologists? Right. And then back to the guiding principles. Uh, so this day, today, uh, in celebrating Data Privacy Day, we focus on leveraging the United Nations guiding principles to promote data privacy and to promote data protection in ways that both uh, technologies and non-technologies can understand. So uh, in the UNGP, there are three... Um, three... Uh, <laughs> Three principles, yeah. <laughs> sorry, there are more than, sorry, not principles. What was the term? Sorry? Pillar, pillar, yes, not pillar. Uh, there were 31 principles, but not, uh, within three pillars, sorry. Uh, so pillar one of the UNDP is the uh, government's duty to respect, uh, sorry, government duty to ensure human rights. Is it ensure? Attack to protect human rights. And, uh, and the second pillar is the business uh, responsibility to respect human rights. And the, the third pillar is uh, access to remedy. Uh, for data-centric digital rights, we have three guiding principles. Uh, the first principle is that jump we've been mentioning since the beginning, which is you are your data. I am your data. You have to look at your data now as part of you. If not the whole you, at least part of you. Um, so when, when, when your data travels from one place to another, you see yourself as traveling from one place to another, from one server to another, or from point A to point B. And if my data is, you know, a part of my hand is here in Malaysia, and then the other side of my hand is somewhere in China, and then they are protected differently under different laws. That, that's how you can imagine how your data becomes in, in the digital space. And the second principle is to actually end remedy. Uh, because it, that does, it does not mean that legislations and, 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 and um, regulations are not important. They are definitely are. Just like how hospitals and clinics are important. We're not saying to not have them at all. <laughs> we should have them. But uh, you don't need to go to the hospital if you are not sick in the first place. And that's the beauty of technology. With technology, you can configure things to protect your data entity without having to go through this, the, the, the length uh, of, uh, of legal remedies should that, ever, should that need ever arise. 
like for example if you want to make sure that facebook deletes your data when you request your facebook to delete your data you should be able to just do that with the click of a button even though you can technically go to court in case you know facebook doesn't do it you can technically go to court and ask you know prove that facebook has done it but the resources the time the energy that that you know that that all that entails um it, it can be reduced that's or minimized at the very least and the third principle uh, is rights by design. If you are familiar with the concept of privacy by design, um, essentially baking uh, the protection of privacy and the protection of people's data into the design of the technology itself with all the processes and protocols. So we want to put that into the, the, same, the same way, the same principle of privacy, but based on rights. All right, and uh, <laughs> uh, before we go into break, actually we are uh, a bit early, but before we go into break, uh, are there anything that you would like to add or comment? Yeah, uh, John? Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. A quick question for the, for the person who might be looking at it first time. So in, in layman term, what you guys are trying to do is, uh, uh, let's say there is GDPR, there is a PDPA, there is so many right. things, right? Uh, All the different standards, yeah. Different standards, yeah. and uh, they have different languages. So you you want to unify them and make sure that those controls are built in technology from the scratch, in layman term. Yeah, of yeah. course, uh, on a deep level, there are many, yeah. many things, technologies, and all, but on a high level, this is what you want to achieve, right? Yes, correct. Actually, that's that's the that's what we see as missing that universality of what re digital rights mean, especially to from a technical standards perspective. You can give me a right, like for example, freedom of expression. If I were a technologist, I could possibly break that down in twenty different ways. Like I, it, and so that's just me. Uh, and, and, and technologies in different countries might have different ideas of what that means, depending on your, uh, your background, your cultural background, your ethical background. So we, um, we have this project actually called uh, UDDR, the Universal, Universal Declaration of Digital Rights, which is something that we don't have yet in the world. And, and you're right in pointing out that this thing doesn't exist yet. So we use tools such as the UNGPs. Uh, we use other international standards in order to derive certain rights that hopefully become as comprehensive as possible. For now, that's the that's where we're at. But towards that universality, yeah, that's definitely a dream. And John can add to that. Yeah. But, so I, I wanted yeah. to 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 pile on what Maria is mentioning. You are a technical person, okay? You're looking at things from the understanding that in order for systems to talk to each other, they need to start to talk standards. They need to know how they're going to be talking to each other. That is not necessarily the, the, the view that has been applied when it comes to, um, to rights or, or specifically ethics. And it's in, 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 in terror, we have a little bit of a qualm between ethics and, and rights, and I'm going to get there now. So the idea is that if data has no limitation whatsoever in the, way, in the way it moves, the same protections that you're expecting in one place should be applied in another place. That is very, very difficult to, um, to achieve if those two places are not agreeing on what are going to be those protections. So at the moment, there's a lot of um, blah, blah, blah. This is where my straightforwardness comes into place uh, about ethics. It's fantastic. It's a very nice buzzword. Ethics here, ethics there, ethics in AI, blah, 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 blah. The problem with ethics is that ethics are intimately attached to cultures. The ethical system of Malaysia is not the same one as the ethical system in China, neither is the one in the US. So if each of one of these places are issuing legislation based on ethical AI, I personally have no idea what they're talking about. Because once the data is going to be moving from a server in the US to a server in China, and then back into India, and then moving to Singapore, and so forth, it's going to be crossing a number of platforms that understands 
ethics differently. So what kind of data are we going to be trying to use and in which way they're going to be using it? There will be no way to actually ensure the same degree of protection. So you want to go into a universality. It's basically standards. That's what technology is coming to place. So one of the, the, the reasons why we look in, in terror of us the rights part and not the ethics part is because rights can be universalized. If you, if you look at what's the bare minimum of things that are common for every single person all around the world, that's where you want to build. And then comes the cultural part, which is totally fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with ethics on itself inside its own context. The problem is technology does not understand the borders. It's not implemented with a border mentality. And for as long as it's going to be moving around, the only thing that is going to be able to protect data at large is to make sure that the base minimum is the common for everybody. I mean, I can give you an example, the air. Does it really matter which culture we are or which ethical system we use for the air to actually be not polluted? Air moves around. And what I want it to be as clean as possible, whatever I am. Because it's a basic system for my organism as a human person, and I'm going to need the air to be able to breathe and to survive. So when I move to France, I want to be able to breathe air too. Those basic things are to be respected no matter where you are. And right now, technology is still not getting there. There's kind of also a number of interests behind it. But that would be the, the and there isn't at the moment a number of taxonomies or technical descriptions to put together or to bring together programmers and, the, and technologies to know exactly how they're going to be protecting that data. That doesn't exist. I'm going to give you an example. Speaking about AI. Um, last year, we had a session in TechUp with uh, um, um, Ansgar Kern, who uh, happens to be quite involved in high-level discussions for um, AI regulations all over the world. And he was giving us a session on um, the state of AI regulations and how to participate. That's another thing that we do in TechUp. We try to provide um, a mapping of the ecosystem uh, to be able to um, understand how to participate. For those, or for those programmers and technologists who want to get into the system and to try to change something. Now, it was interesting that during his presentation, he was describing a number of regulations from different places in the world. And there was this recurring expression, data minimization based on use case. For this regulation, for that regulation, for that regulation. And then we ask him, um, OK. So everyone is looking at use cases. What's the definition of use case? What's the standard? What kind of ISO are they taking off or IEEE definition about the different use cases so that we know exactly what they're talking about? Well, there isn't any. Every single regulation in the world who is talking about minimalization in use cases they don't have an actual document to back up what kind of definition of use cases is. Are you kidding me? Are you going to tell me that you can't? It can be as, as a big list as you want. It's still a finite number. And it should be something that everyone is agreeing upon. So that when you build your regulations on AI, they are based on you know use case number 47 or whatever, this particular type of case, this particular type of commercial transaction, this particular type of uh, healthcare consultation, whatever it is, and then you can establish what's going to be the minimum necessary so you can minimize the data required for those operations, for those use cases. Well, there isn't a consensus on that. So again, if I'm going to be moving um, data from one system to another, different jurisdictions, how am I going to be making sure that the data is going to be treated with the same degree of protection than in other places? It's virtually impossible at the moment. Even more so if we don't have the tools to test that, as I, that's another conversation itself. Does yeah. that answer the question? Go ahead. Yep. Yeah, so, so basically, uh, that takes us to the same challenge which the current uh, privacy regulations are having. Mm -hmm. GDPR is there, but I'm not trying to pinpoint, but let's say, why Malaysia, why Singapore care right. about it. Right, yeah. So, even let's say we are coming up with standards and all, that will make sense in Europe, mm -hmm. makes, makes sense in developed countries like USA, but why Malaysia, Singapore, Taiwan, different? Uh, yeah, all these countries will, will care about it. Yeah, I will give an example of one of my close friends who who was having profile on uh, uh, on the 
uh, Joe Portals. Okay, and the Joe Portal is based in UK, but uh, they are having relation with him. And he tried to ask them constantly to delete his profile because he was not seeking job anymore. Mm. But he didn't get to reply. So yeah. that's again I'm throwing the question back that how how we will solve that challenge uh, of you know having the same problem as the privacy regulations are having. Is that a problem of uh, discrimination? Right. 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 And he's requesting for the data to be deleted. Right. Yeah. Right. So we, we, that's that's the example that Marion was was giving. The problem is that, is that we don't have a way to ensure that observance of a request technically. So going back to GDPR, full disclosure, I prefer to live in a world where GDPR exists than not. That's fine. Now, does GDPR solve the problem? No. I'm going to make some enemies here. Essentially because it describes a very theoretical framework where things should be happening, but there is no actual guidance on how is that to be implemented. And so 25 different teams who are basically building the same HR management system are going to interpret technically uh, GDPR in a different way. Yeah. And you will not be able to test unless you have enough money to hire a very expensive consultant company who's going to go through your code base and say, no, 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 yes, you are compliant. Sign a paper, off you go. But that's not what I really want. What I really want is that everyone follows a specific standard of implementation so that when they issue that piece of software, it can be tested for compliance. And when I go to, let's say, my online banking system and they claim I'm GDPR compliant, I actually have a way to bloody verify that. It's not the case. And think about how much money it costs to be compliant in the way that I'm, that I'm mentioning, and hire a consultant company, et cetera, et cetera. How is that cost going to be borne by um, small companies, startups? Yep. That's, that's not fair for them. Well, if the government or the industry would issue what we call a DRSDK, a Digital Rights Software Development Kit, it would allow you to just be compliant by incorporating that SDK into your uh, software architecture, and it would be prone to be able to be test, so test, uh, uh, test units for technical people, for unit test, sorry. You would be, thanks. You would be uh, able to send that to a sandbox into an agency that has the tools to verify, double check, off you go, you can go to the market. That's exactly what happens with the car industry. It's not a big deal. We are not reinventing the wheel. This is, this is exactly what's happening with every single industry in the world that you can think of that has a, a medicum of protection by the government. It's just not happening for public consumption software for whatever reason. I mean, for historical reason, we can, again, spend the whole day discussing why. Now... Jean, sorry, yeah. uh, can you wrap up? No. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's essentially, there is a huge um, problem and challenge when it comes to that internationalization. And specifically, it is because the people who should have been invited to the table, basically technical people, are not as often as necessary invited to those policy-making documents. And everything just remains at the policy level, at the lower level. But then, funny thing is that they are not the ones implementing. Yeah. So it's not against bad. against. It's not a case against lawyer. It's not a case against legislation. We do need legislation in order to give the legal, uh, the legal legitimacy to what you're going to implement technologically. But technology has to go coincide with the public policy together. But uh, I don't want to take uh, eat more time into the break. Uh, we're going to come back here at 10.15 for the panel session. Uh, so we have exactly 10 minutes for, for, uh, for tea break. Uh, tea break is uh, out this door towards the back on your left. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for listening to the first half of the day. Yay! And uh, we'll have our break and come back in 10 minutes. Thank you, everyone.
invite the panel speakers and the moderator to come on stage so that once the camera goes on, there you go. And I'm going to step down. <laughs> oh, here's a clean one for you. Uh, we have another. We have another mic, right, for the audience. I can use this. I can use this. I can use. So we have an exciting panel coming on soon. I will be introduced. Uh, just cue me when the camera is on. Oh, we're live. Okay, great. We are live. Yes. Can. Do you need a small table? We can. Do we have a small table? Oh, sorry. That's a clicker. Okay. Uh, can you call the? Okay. So, um, I think that we are still waiting for the others to come back in, but uh, let's uh, just continue because I think uh, this panel, I honestly can't wait for it uh, because when I conceptualized it, uh, it was like, what is the most pressing question that we want to know right now? Do we have a chance or do we not have a chance to have digital rise in the National Action Plan? But of course, the National Action Plan is not the only avenue for digital rights advocacy. Digital rights advocacy can come in many forms, not just the UNGP BHR. Uh, I'm sure Microsoft has their own program uh, with BHR. And um, the center recently just launched an online hate speech tracker. And uh, we have many examples in Malaysia and also across the world on digital rights advocacy. So, of course, this is not the only thing. But the title of the panel today is, Do, Is There Room for Digital Rights in the Malaysian National Action Plan for Business and Human Rights? And uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for today. Uh, let's give a round of applause to Nabila Hussain. She... Wait, I need to get to you. Okay. <laughs> so prior to her current role as... Okay, no, actually, this was... <laughs> okay, let me read. This... Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm confused which line. Okay, no. Uh, so currently, uh, Nabila, you are the manager for government affairs, Southeast Asia and new markets, uh, uh, new markets at Microsoft. But previously, you are a tech policy fellow and policy communications lead at the... Social and Economic Research Initiative, uh, Surrey, uh, a think tank working on evidence-based policies to address inequality and issues at the intersection of technology and society. So a lot of our conversations today will be led uh, by someone with a lot of experience on that subject, uh, the, the, that, that, you know, crossroads between tech and, so, and, and society. So uh, without further ado, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Mariam, and uh, Assalamu alaikum and very good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second half of our um, celebration or recognition of Data Privacy Day today. Um, and thank you, Mariam, for the very kind introduction. I will have the privilege of introducing our subject matter experts uh, for our panel discussion today. And we have about an hour ahead of us and quite a broad topic to tackle. As we heard, digital rights cuts across a multitude of topics uh, ranging from labor to environment to governance. And it includes a variety of areas, um, right to privacy, freedom of information, freedom of expression, right to be forgotten, and our ability to access online spaces. And during the course of the pandemic, we saw how interconnected we are of more than any telco tower, submarine cable could provide with the virus really showing no respect for boundaries. We also saw how digital infrastructure, digital connectivity became lifelines for the pandemic, but not for everyone. Digital rights really hinge on our access to connectivity, and this is among the issues that we are here to discuss today. What do digital rights mean in Malaysia's context? What are some of the opportunities and challenges as we consider digital rights being included in Malaysia's National Action Plan for Business and Human Rights? And what is the way forward for Malaysia? So we really have quite a lot of work to do over the next 60 minutes, and to unpack this, we have three panelists who are subject matter experts in their respective fields. We have Jehan Wan Aziz at my far left, Business and Human Rights Specialist at the United Nations Development Program. To her right, we have Farlina Mamad Said, Senior Analyst at ISIS Malaysia. And to my left, we have Tam Jiaben, 
researcher at the center. I'd also like to acknowledge everyone who's here with us in the room, physically and virtually, representatives from the public sector, private sector, civil society, members of the media, and all our respected audience members. I'd also like to say that uh, we are welcoming questions, so please do send these along, and do let us know as well to whom you'd like the questions addressed. So to kick us off, to start our discussion, I'd like to turn to UNDP Business and Human Rights Specialist, Jehan. Jehan, the UNDP has played a central role in the development of Malaysia's business and human rights agenda and is one of the key organizations involved in the development of Malaysia's National Action Plan. So perhaps, um, could you share with us where we are now and what lies ahead as we work towards the milestone of the BHRNAP being launched by 2023? Um, thanks so much, Nabila. Um, so I'm going to quickly, you know, give a little bit more context to um, the business and human rights agenda in Malaysia um, and also touch upon where we are um, in terms of our development of the National Action Plan. Waiting for my slides to show up. Sorry, just um, bear with us for a few minutes. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. So I'm going to try and do this. Um, Um, so I'm going to try and um, sort of just give uh, a quick overview of the UNDP uh, business and human rights agenda, um, given the context in Asia, but also specifically in Malaysia. Okay, so the BHI Asia project is a regional project um, that is funded by the EU uh, for purposes of um, developing and implementing the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. So as Mariam has mentioned earlier um, in her session, um, the UNGPs um, comprise of three pillars and 31 principles, um, with the overall aim of ensuring that we are protecting the rights of people and the planet um, through, the, through impacts by the business, uh, by business operations. Um, at the at the moment, we are present in seven countries, including Malaysia, um, with Mongolia being um, the most recent addition um, to the project. Um, and at the moment, um, there are four countries um, in Asia that have launched the National Action Plan, um, with the recent one being Pakistan. So our work um, on business and human rights Asia is primarily um, focused on our work with the government. Um, and so we focus on policy coherence um, and uh, policy making um, with the government, but also with um, NHRIs, so National Human Rights Institutions. So in Malaysia, the, our NHRI is Suhakam, um, the Malaysian Commission um, on Human Rights. Um, so this is where um, the MAP, uh, development of the MAP sits under our work um, that we do with the government of Malaysia. Um, other, other activities that we focus on um, are awareness raising on the UNGPs, um, on the larger context of business and human rights, um, and on human rights due diligence um, and related policy actions. Um, we also have a very strong um, regional and um, South-South cooperation uh, model in which we learn from other countries um, in the region. 
Um, so of the countries that are in the project, um, Thailand will be the most advanced with um, their launch of the MEP a couple of years ago. Um, and India, as well as Indonesia, are quickly catching up. So they have their draft um, MEPs ready. Um, so as mentioned, Nabila mentioned earlier, um, Malaysia hopes to launch our own MEP by 2023. So we have about um, two years to do this. Um, the third part um, is capacity building for businesses. So for example, um, there is a lot of investment in um, conducting uh, capacity building or training uh, with businesses, um, in particular SMEs, um, especially um, on things like human rights due diligence. Um, so this is a core concept of the UNGPs and is part of the access to remedy framework. We also support um, MHRIs, um, again in our case, Suhaka, um, as well as civil society organizations um, and human rights defenders. Um, the Business and Human Rights Agenda in Malaysia is not new. Um, it has been 10 years in the making. Um, and this, is re this was really started um, by the work that Suhakam did um, 10 years ago. Um, in 2015, uh, they had uh, published a strategic framework on the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights, which was then um, shared with the government. Um, and between uh, 2015, and more recently, in 2019, um, they launched this process is um, finally launched um, with the blessing of the cabinet. So this uh, big mutual agenda is placed under the purview of the Legal Affairs Division, which sits in the Prime Minister's Department, um, and they are primarily uh, instructed to essentially develop this national action plan. So where are we in the current development process? Um, UNDP has been working closely with um, Bayou and Suhakam um, and intensifying our efforts to really kickstart this conversation. Um, so the development of the MEP has five um, key phases, uh, preparation, development, implementation, monitoring, and finally evaluation. Um, we are currently in the de development phase. So between 2020 and 2023, um, we have really focused on uh, bringing more awareness and building capacity of the government and related institutions so that we can develop um, this uh, national action plan together. So last year, um, part of the development phase, um, the first steering committee on um, the development of the NEP was conducted, chaired by um, the, the minister and the prime minister's department. Um, in September, we had our very first national conference on business and human rights, um, which had five, over 500 registrants join us um, online. Um, and the government then had the opportunity to hear, uh, announce the launch, um, uh, our ambitions to have uh, our MEP launched by 2023. Uh, as mentioned, um, the thematic areas under the MEP uh, labor, environment, and governance. Um, this was based um, on the priorities of um, the government of Malaysia. Um, and cost cutting themes um, include, um, but are not limited to, gender and, of course, digital rights. Uh, our next step, um, which we are focusing on this year, is the National Baseline Assessment. Um, and with this MBA, we hope to, to be able to evaluate further. Um, and prioritize thematic um, key areas and um, key issues in business and human rights. I think those are, yeah, that's the end of my slides. I'm going to stop there and pass the floor back to Nabila. Thank you so much, Jehan. I think that that's incredibly helpful in terms of both providing us an update as well as ensuring that we all have a, the same understanding of where we are now and, and where we're headed. Um, shall we maybe move back to our Sorry about that. Um, so building further on, on what Jehan has shared with us, I think as we continue to, to delve deeper into this topic, um, I, I have a question here for all three of our panelists. And the question is, if there is one thing that everyone in our audience here today should understand about digital rights, as we consider the inclusion of digital rights in Malaysia's National Action Plan, what would that one thing be? Uh, perhaps, Javan, would you like to start us off? 
Um, oh, okay. Got it. So I would say, uh, this is my work, um, it's more integrating your daily activities than you think. Um, you know, everything from your morning water messages to simple mindless comment you post online involves your right to digital spaces, right? Um, but on top of that, it also involves your right to control how what you say and do online um, are being used, as well as your right to continue using these spaces freely. Thank you so much for that. And I think Javun actually probably placed it really well. It's actually about being able to use the online spaces safely. And I think from our research, um, something that we've actually noticed and how, because this is actually also a conversation that's still unfolding. Therefore, I'm not actually saying that I have the answer. But I think how we've actually understood how it can be contextualized is uh, we can actually look at the cyber or digital realm, one, as a medium. Therefore, it's, it becomes a medium where certain things happen and then they actually require certain protections. For instance, um, you may actually use your social media spaces for certain types of expressions and then you would actually want to express uh, that would actually be your freedom of expression types of principles and things like that. Um, the second part is actually about it being the technology itself actually being a tool to potentially displace or affect human rights. And I think that's where you actually get certain new ideas when you actually talk about algorithms and you actually talk about data because these are actually conversations on how certain um, certain technologies impact how human rights are actually typically practiced or would actually introduce further issues in the future. For instance, the conversation about data ownership may not be relevant to somebody who's actually is, uh, who was alive in 18 hundreds, for instance. So, so, it, uh, so these are actually some of the ways we actually notice some of the conversations unfolding. Um, but I think when you're actually asking about like, uh, what, uh, what is it that we feel people should know about um, digital rights, I think one, I suppose, is that question about what it is. I think the second question is about who is doing something about it. And I think the third is actually who can in this space actually move the barometer to actually do something about digital rights. Because I think some of the conversations that we do understand is occurring in a very, very limited and small space. And it's actually only available to certain people. And I think this affects the type of stakeholders that's actually at the table. So just putting that out there. Um, I think for me, you know, we should look at digital rights um, as an extension of the fundamental rights that we are already, you know, very familiar with. Um, you know, I think as the fellow panelists have mentioned, um, you know, it's understanding rights in the age of the internet, essentially. And we're just talking about a different time, a time frame, a different medium. Um, and when we think of human rights, we tend to think of, you know, traditional, traditional rights. Um, but really, in fact, we have been practicing um, ways to exercise digital rights, um, you know, for example, through the right to, right to um, information, um, our access to public services online, um, you know, freedom of expression, things like that. So we are, you know, we should look at it as an opportunity to be able to an, um, expand inclusivity um, in the, by understanding, by further understanding what our rights mean in the context um, of the digital space. Thank you for that. I think just, just to sort of summarize as we move on along um, in this conversation, it, digital rights is really about the spaces that we operate in online, the technologies, but also the entire ecosystem who is involved in these conversations, especially as technology has become so pervasive. Uh, the question of who is included and excluded today um, really does influence societal discourse, activity, and um, impact on society more broadly, both online and offline. So I think those are really important considerations for us to keep in mind. Um, as we go on to the next question, which, um, so we've talked, we've seen what where Malaysia is, we've talked a little bit about digital rights broadly, but I think now to kind of dig a little bit deeper into um, the right to privacy, given that we are here to discuss data privacy. Uh, the right to privacy, I think, is probably the most well-known of all the digital rights which exist. But we have seen that technology continues to challenge the notion 
of privacy, especially in relation to data protection. Um, I'm sure most of us in this room, if not all of us, have used applications allowing us to have food delivered either to ourselves or to someone else. And we've seen how food delivery personnel and gig workers have really formed the front lines, especially during the pandemic. This has raised questions and highlighted a lot of issues, particularly related to workers' rights in digital spaces. Um, in relation to the use of data in monitoring, evaluating, and potentially also exploitation of workers in digital platforms. We are also seeing developments across the world in terms of national digital IDs. And many of us are familiar with the concept of working from home. And this, in some instances, also leads to workplace monitoring and potentially also surveillance. So I'd like to come closer to home looking for and focusing specifically on the Malaysian context. I think the question that I like to raise to our panelists is how do we balance privacy with harms towards society at large? And is there ever the risk of too much privacy? I'll open it up to, to whoever would like to go first. Um, I can go first. <laughs> um, so I think one really good example is our use of Mal Sajatra, right? Um, so it really exemplifies um, the need for this balance uh, between public safety but also our right to our information. Um, and I think the regulatory environment here plays an extremely important role. Um, there needs to be clear checks and balances. Um, there needs to be more transparency in how these systems are set up, um, uh, what they are set up to do, but also how to use these technologies um, in a safe manner. So we need to be asking ourselves, or society needs to be asking, um, has the government um, given us enough information to really understand the purpose of the MySojatra app? Um, have we been given, um, have we allowed consent um, in order to, you know, give up a little bit of our rights um, so that we, we are able to ensure public safety? Um, what happens to our data um, once we no longer have to use the app. So these are some of the questions and we, we need to really push back against um, you know, some of these technologies that are emerging um, that kind of toe the line between the right to privacy um, and also public safety or public good. Um, so two days ago, um, the EU Commission uh, had actually put forward a declaration um, on digital rights, which is um, really extremely exciting. Um, so steps like this are really crucial to signal to companies that um, they have a responsibility uh, to uphold rights and they are being monitored. Um, and again, we go back to the idea of inclusive participation um, and this is really key and ensuring that human rights defenders are part of, the uh, part of that conversation, they are brought to the table so that they can um, participate meaningfully in how these systems are set up. Um, so I'm just going to stop there. Hello. Um, so I really like um, what Yuan said about uh, how do we become okay with giving up a little bit of our rights uh, for a good of public safety, right? So um, at the center, I primarily work um, a lot on freedom of expression, and we kind of explore this question a little bit as well. So, um, for example, on social media, we have so much of harmful content online, and we see that we have very, very real world consequences. Um, but in between all of this, there's a very flourishing, uh, very much flourishing debate about the right to privacy, right, and um, right to freely post what you want online. So, obviously, we at the center, we believe that this right to writing what you want, saying what you want, and having your rights over that has to be balanced with your responsibilities to, towards society at large. Um, like, there has to be a point in time where we draw the line and say, look, the risk towards certain groups of people or communities is clearly larger than the risk of not upholding your right to say what you want um, and your privacy. So um, I would raise an example of the stopping predator gram um, on Telegram like, that flourished in social media a while back. 
um, it was a bunch of Telegram groups that were exposed as um, having predatory information on women and girls, right? Um, and that's one clear example of where we need to cross over the line and say, this is a clearly bigger risk uh, to its society than your privacy. Um, and I think I also raise another example of what we did at Assembly recently. So we launched this uh, initiative we call Track Energy, where we kind of track and analyze online hate speech in Malaysia. And this idea of hate speech is actually based on our previous study of what is hateful to us. So we, in the process of developing that, we have seen so many calls from violence, threats, and, um, you know, calling for marginalization of certain communities. And that's, I think, a really very good example of what I mean by drawing that line. Yeah. Carlina, would you like to add? Sure. I think actually your question about too much privacy is actually quite interesting because I guess um, the, the conversation is always the genie is out of the bottle, the data is actually being used, your data is actually being collected. And I think as we heard from the panels this morning, your data is actually pretty useless if it doesn't have context. So in that sense, even, even to a certain extent, good governance actually comes from good data collection. Because for instance, if you actually give out your cash handouts, but you actually don't know who you give it out to, or you don't actually map that out, then how do you actually do that efficiently? Or how do you actually improve the systems to ensure that you actually uh, fix certain economic problems? So in that sense, the data, the, the concept of data collection, I think to a certain extent is supposed to feed into good governance. I think, but um, so the, if the genie is out of the bottle, then we're actually talking about potential harms that can happen. For instance, Javan actually talked about like uh, the social media spaces and things like that. So if you actually are functioning online and people actually collect your information and to a certain extent um, curate your experiences online, so then it becomes you actually your, your social spaces become smaller you can actually become biased in thinking. So in this sense, it can actually polarize society, which actually creates further problems down the line for a healthy society. So I think concepts that we do have to think about is like digital citizenship. What do you actually think the human should actually be like online and offline? And I think like the type of uh, concerns that would actually happen so I think certain things uh, that would actually be a part of this conversation would be if you're actually talking about the ecosystem and governance and how do you actually ensure that your data collected is actually used responsibly. And I think that is a part, that is the question that goes back to governance and uh, it's about enforcement and actually in compliance. But we also understand that a lot of these processes are actually developing. And I think the government to a certain extent is actually in this, in this huge modernization process where there's a lot of confusion about how certain enforcements and compliance should actually occur. So I think in, in that sense, um, the, the stakeholders at the table should be wider than just the, the government. And it goes, I think, to what Jehan was presenting about the business, business sectors actually practicing certain norms when it comes to digital rights or actually being able to create that safe spaces as well. Um, so these are actually just like initial thoughts. So, yeah. oh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think with what Jehan said, starting us off with my Sajatra, I think in the last two years, all of us have become more, um, if not comfortable with giving our data away, we are more comfortable with the concept of data, thinking about what that means, whose hands is it in, what is it being used for, and also when we talk about consent, is it informed consent or is it just ticking a box so we can load the next page and get the service that we're looking to get. And I think um, with what Javan said about uh, balancing right risks in determining what rights we get, we also have to think about responsibilities. And I think that really leads to what uh, Farlina talked about with digital citizenship and the digital values that we want to see in our society and reflected in our national action plan as well, because we can't have rights without responsibilities. And particularly on the point on compliance and law enforcement, I think one of the things that we have seen as well is uh, I think something that Mariam talked about earlier, which was how uh, technology, policy, and legislation have to move together in the same direction. 
but very often legislation and policy lag behind technology moves at a fast much faster pace and so i think there is also a need for us to think about as we bring stakeholders to the table what laws and policies need to be refreshed so that it it really reflects the digital age that that we live in um, I, I do wonder maybe if we could bring up the questions um, from the audience on the screen, if that would be possible. Um, and we can also bring our virtual, virtual audience in uh, the conversation as well. But maybe in the meantime, I'd like to uh, pivot to social media, because I think it would really be remiss for us to have this conversation without discussing social media. Like, I'm sure influences our lives if we all won't have accounts in one way or another. I think we've seen that from Charlie Hebdo to the Capital Hill riot to very recently the mobilization of volunteers during the flood. Um, navigating the opportunities and the challenges presented by social media is really a very delicate balancing act between right to safety, freedom of expression, and the rights. So, Javan, I know that you've done quite a lot of work in this space. Uh, can you share with us your take on digital rights? And what are some policy recommendations that we should consider for making this action? And so I. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Testing. Okay, great. Thanks, Navita. So, um, yeah, thanks for the intro. Um, I think as mentioned before, there's so much of debate about how to tackle these digital harms that, like Mariam said, have very real consequences on us as people offline. So I would say the current political polarization happening around the world at, and at home um, isn't really helping the situation, right? Um, and I think every one of us, um, we're, we're trying to figure out how do we curb these real harms um, with in, in the manner that minimizes the risk towards our rights, right? Um, and there's a lot of debating on what's proportional measures towards these harms, um, how do we deal with them, how do we identify them, right? And I think, I'll just comment on what we say, uh, what we look at at the center um, when we study the perceptions of hate speech in Malaysia, right? um, this happened in 2020. So we learned that there's quite a lot of appetite from um, citizens to talk about dealing with online harms in a proportionate manner. Uh, we, we presented some scenarios to them and we figured out that heavy-handed actions like, um, say, permanent account deletion from the business side of things to even being reported to authorities or even arrests, right? Um, they should only be made for, you know, content that reaches a certain harmful threshold, right? Um, say, um, calls for physical violence, calls for arms, right? So I think that proportionality um, in dealing with online harms is really, really crucial, right? Um, we want to, we know we're giving up certain rights already, but we want to minimize the risk towards our rights. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. I think proportionality is is really an, an important uh, concept and factor that we need to think about because online harm is not a, a homogeneous concept. Uh, it's really a spectrum, right? Whether you're harming one individual, an entire society, we've seen in cases um, where uh, online comments or posts have led to physical violence and even death offline. And so there really needs to be this balancing of risks and harm, um, which again comes back to who are we including in this conversation? Who are we excluding? What are we considering? And, and what are we not considering? I'm just going to pause here in case Farlina or Jehan would like to add to, to Javan's. I actually do have a, I think it's something that's interesting when you're actually looking at social media. And then I guess something about, um, 
uh, gov- governing, not really governing, I guess navigating through content to actually discern what is hate speech, what is actually not hate speech and things like that. And I think in some parts of the world, some responsibility of this actually goes back to government and they actually expect government, okay, you actually censor and then you actually put it down. And in other, But we actually have to understand that cyberspace that is actually this uh, multi-stakeholder environment and you actually have different jurisdictions. And I think in that sense, um, there is that triangle of you actually have the users on one end, you have the private sector trying to actually determine their own oversight boards or any any type of body to actually uh, go sift through the content to actually uh, categorize is this hate speech, is this not? And then they actually have to struggle with um, maintaining the autonomy or actually the the, the sense of um, transparency on how they actually categorize the type of contents. And then the governments, they actually definitely, we would be familiar with what they actually have uh, in regards to national security concerns. For instance, they actually, there are certain things that is, uh, if it actually meets the threshold of violence, it actually it hits local legislation and things like that. But with hate speech or something like that, it actually becomes quite complicated. And I think in this sense, the, the 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 stakeholders, the different stakeholders, do actually have to set the table and actually do have to converse. And I think it's an it's because it's content and narratives. It actually tends to be context based, and because it's context based. Um, it becomes, uh, that's where you actually do get the different, uh, some, a country at the other side of the world probably don't regard certain things as harmful as this side. And I think that's where the work of the center is actually so precious for things like this. Yeah, so I, I think that would just be, I just want to add that to the stakeholder conversation. Um, I think maybe just to add a little bit about, you know, this idea of context. Um, you know, in, in Malaysia, our data privacy laws are insufficient, right? Um, we, we know about PDBA, but it really doesn't go beyond sort of um, our data um, privacy, our data privacy in the context of commercial transactions. Um, but on the flip side, we also um, have, you know, overzealous uh, uh, laws that uh, limit our freedom of expression. Um, and this occurs primarily in the social media space. Um, so we have things like the Sedition Act, which is used um, against people um, expressing their views. Um, and so the, the same goes, bringing it back to how businesses operate, um, you know, uh, and the same goes for companies. Um, many companies have social media policies um, that employers, employees have to adhere to. Um, and uh, in many cases, this might be detrimental to the employee. Um, and so we're, we're kind of working within you know, this, this kind of structure at the moment. Um, but what we sh- really should be envisioning is um, feeling, workers um, should be feeling safe, um, even in the digital space, um, um, and should not, say, for example, be worried that, you know, my employer is looking through my social media and making decisions based on what they find there, for example. Um, so I just wanted to add that um, comment. Thank you. I think... The, the point particularly on, on private sector um, involvement in, in this space, I think comes to the heart of what, of what we're talking about today, given that it's about business and human rights, states and businesses protecting, respecting and providing a, a right a pathway for, for remedy. Um, and I think that might be one of the, the hurdles or the difficulties, given that uh, when we talk about infrastructure, generally it's something provided by the state, whether it's electricity or water. But today we have digital infrastructure that cuts across whether it's citizen services, education or healthcare. And this is infrastructure that's primarily private sector owned. And it doesn't fit as neatly into um, systems, societal, you know, institutional policies, regulations that exist for state-owned infrastructure. And I think that that's something that we're seeing um, as a challenge in terms of regulatory transformation that's needed, not only in Malaysia, but around the world. As, as we continue on in, in this digital realm that, that we now live in. Um, I, I think maybe we should turn to the questions. We have about 15 minutes to go, and we have some questions coming in from the audience. Uh, we have a question here from Pai Ru Chung, which states, Indigenous data sovereignty principles outline these principles of ethics and respect. Our ability to counter xenophobia and other discriminations need to respect these ethnic, <laughs> these ethical <laughs> values. Apologies, sorry. Um, so, um, I'm, uh, are you able to come up? 
that was more of a statement than, than an actual question. We yeah, basically took it out from the from the chat because the chat doesn't have the ability to show things in a full screen. Right. For the rest okay. Of the, Thank of you. The I wasn't sure. If maybe we needed to scroll down, and there was a question below. Okay. Um, our audience... I don't have a question though to the for, okay, for, the, yes, for the panel. Yes. So you guys were pointing out to the game is big uh, on digital citizenship. So I would like to ask you: This is the digital citizenship for whom or for what? For me as a physical person? or for the digital twins that are generated outside of my models that might be residing in some other jurisdiction. What is the citizenship of that model? Sure. I think that's actually a very good question. And I think um, to actually assume that cyberspace is not transborder is actually, uh, uh, it would actually be difficult for governments to, to, uh, to come up with a specific legislation that's actually needed to address certain issues. So to a certain extent, the digital citizenship should address that your, your uh, for, for governments at least, that some of these areas actually move past their jurisdiction. So that becomes quite necessary. But at the same time, the the impact or the yeah the impact of a domestic uh, normalization of digital citizenship ideas would actually be quite effective because that actually uh, it ties in with what the governments can actually do within their own areas so this actually goes into things like how do you actually normalize certain digital hygiene behaviors how do you normalize certain digital literacy behaviors so the idea of the digital citizenship the 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 individual actually does have to understand that they are actually um, functioning in a space that is beyond what they, what you would actually, it's a, it's a space that is wider than what they would actually assume it to be. And I think that actually has, that has to cut through most of the ideas for jurisdiction because it's an agreement that actually has to come between the government or governments and also the, the people. That would be my initial thoughts about it. I do have, I do have a follow up on that precisely because of that topic. So. Buzzword aside, we're going to be sooner or later experiencing a lot of immersive experiences, which is nowadays understood as metaverses and so forth. Metaverses are not uh, a new thing. I mean, you get uh, Second Life happening from early 2010, so uh, that's not a new phenomenon. I mean, it's not a new technology, but it's possibly a new phenomenon, if you will. So the, the question, or the, the, what really bothers me is, how many of those metaverses are built and managed by governments? To my knowledge, zero. So we discuss about digital citizenship. What the hell are we talking about? In which terms? Because they're going to be, yeah, regimented by terms and conditions from companies. And good luck being able to elect the next CEO of the company that is managing that particular metaverse. And so it, it kind of becomes important to decide what is it that we want to understand as digital citizenship, because if we still want to express the same type of protections that we are assuming for our physicality, well, it might not be playing so well if governments are not doing their own part to have their own space for their own data of their own citizens, so it is protected in the same ways as yada, 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 yada. I mean, I can go for on and on on, on this. I would like to, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I actually do. And this is actually, it's going to actually end up in this conversation where I actually talk about that triangle. Also, it may not necessarily be an answer, that, therefore I just apologize to everybody uh, to begin with. Um, so the conversation, if we're actually trying to look at governance in, in cyberspace or technologies, you actually do have to look at where the power structures are and where the power structures lie. And if you actually look at, you have the users, you have the private sector, you have the government. And to a certain extent, this triangle actually has to be at equal tension or in places where they can actually provide the check and balances to each other. So to, yes, jurisdiction or metaverses, considering it's on platforms and things like that, actually it, it is within the jurisdiction of the private sector and you cannot actually elect the next CEO or things like that. But where would the recourse be for the people or for, the, for, for users to actually ensure that certain types of principles or values are actually upheld in these type of spaces? So either they would actually be able to have certain types of momentum to actually converse or to actually um, 
to pressure the, the private sector into doing what needs to be done, or they would actually be able to pressure the government. In different societies, they will actually find different types of uh, tension and different types of preference. Because uh, it would perhaps in certain societies, the private sector, there are actually certain recourse available. Maybe you can actually WeChat them and actually just completely bombard them with your requests or things like that. And then they would actually have to bow down to the things that you say. But in other societies, they would find it easier for you to actually pressure the government and be like, governments, do something about this, regulate this properly. So different societies may actually have different types of preference on how they would actually deal with things. And I think this is why that, that power, uh, the power triangle is actually quite relevant for Malaysia. It actually needs to be addressed. There has to actually be greater solutions than just, um, just having one stakeholder or two stakeholders at the table. You do need more stakeholders. So that would just be, a, I, I'm not sure that I got here. I, I answered your question. Perhaps two, two thoughts uh, arising from that. So when we talk about, for example, the, the power triangle and the fact that governments today may not be looking at emerging technologies such as you know, whether it's the artificial intelligence, blockchain, or the metaverse, maybe we also need to question why that's the case. Is it, is it a reluctance because of um, fear? Um, uh, maybe questions around how do we regulate this? Is it a lack of skills? Uh, so maybe there's also a question again linked to our point on regulatory transformation on how do governments, policymakers need to skill and transform it's not just about learning how to code but also how to develop policies so that civil, um, so that the civil service know how to use these technologies and create a space where it's an enabling environment for innovation that protects people. And it's not entirely in the hands of private sector, but when we talk about public-private partnership, for example, it's truly coming together on, a, on an equal digital playing field. Um, but what, whatever that means, that's, I think, up to us to decide. But I think it comes back to those questions about regulation, about skills, about talent. And then the other point to this, when you talk about remedy, whether we are to go to the, as a user, to go to the private sector entity or to the government, I think there's also, it comes back to a question of knowledge. Um, sorry, I think there's some feedback, right? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just going to try a different microphone. Hopefully that's coming through clearer. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so when, when we're looking at, at the the concept of remedy as well, I think similar to in the development of these different regulations, when we're defining these uh, channels for remedy, I think there's also a question of who has access to these pathways for remedy. I mean, in so many instances, uh, they might, they may be, um, I have had instances where I've dealt with a chatbot that's unable to understand what my question is or my uh, complaint or concern is. Um, if I'm a blind person who wants to access banking services that are online, but it happens to not be compatible with my screen reader, I'm now locked out of financial services. I may not be able to apply for a loan, open a new bank account. So I think we really need to think about these cross-cutting issues that really go deeper. Um, the digital space, once upon a time, may have been only for those of us who were computer scientists or gamers. But today, it's really so much more than that. And, and I'm really, really encouraged by the depth of, of our conversation. Um, unfortunately, we are reaching the end. Um, I'm just going to check if we have any more questions from the audience. We don't seem to have any. I wanted, however, to point out what I'm putting on the, um, uh, on the screen. This is the introduction on how to participate in the IETF, otherwise uh, the Internet Engineers Tasking Force. Uh, this is the main group that um, uh, works on the um, uh, new generations of protocols that uh, govern the, the Internet in terms of communication. And to the point that you were mentioning before, Nabila, as in literally, this always shocked me quite a bit. This is the Getting Started Guide, and right on the introduction, second sentences very clearly, we try to avoid policy and business questions as much as possible. I mean, that's quite telling. And there, I, I do understand that it may have a component of trying to be as objective as possible and not to be biased and so forth. But the fact that you're already telling people, try to avoid policy, I mean, they should be involved in policy. 
in the most objective possible way, et cetera, et cetera, but there has to be a training for technologists to be able to participate in policy. Otherwise, they will keep being ostracized and they're not going to be asked to be participating in places that are going to be affecting their job later on. Yeah, absolutely. Te technologists participating in policymaking, but also policymakers understanding what technology means. So I think with just a couple minutes left, I think we have to go to our final question, which is really circling back to the theme of our panel discussion today. Um, is there room for digital rights in Malaysia's National Action Plan for Business and Human Rights? And if there is one recommendation or intervention that you would like to see in the National Action Plan, what would that be? Could we start with you, Chairman? Um, definitely. And I think... I, would, I can just I could just reiterate um, what I've been saying. Um, like Maya mentioned very very rightfully, we are really our digital twin, right? Uh, we, we really really are, and there are so many effects and consequences that come from what we do online um, with our presence. So I think um, if there's I know the question was if there was one recommendation, but I would like to give two. <laughs> um, so um, I would say for the state, um, there's a lot of conversation about how policymakers have yet to really understand the scope of technology on their citizens' lives, right? So I, I, I would recommend um, just being able to highlight and review current laws and policies that involves uh, citizens' use of digital spaces, right? Um, everything from the use of their data, um, protecting their data, as well as the freedom to express yourself online. Um, and there really, really needs um, to be clearer definition of what constitutes proper use of network facilities, for example, I'm referring to um, the Communications and Multimedia Act and um, what, what constitutes breaching them as well, right? Um, if we can't go all the way to talking about involving full digital rights in our policies, I think this is a great start. Um, as for businesses, um, corporates, I would recommend um, just knowing better how um, the use of technology involves your employees and your users, right? Um, um, right to curb certain harmful elements as well better um you know we we you know to curb them we need to better identify and analyze them and this takes a lot more learning um of online harmful contents and um how it has real world impact i think that's really really important thank you thank you so much and uh i think my one point that I would actually, I suppose, like to emphasize when it comes to this is um, in regards to, I think, something that Jehan actually mentioned uh, about um, when you actually have businesses, because the conversation actually went into like jurisdiction and the businesses actually having certain types of jurisdiction for their own employees and things like that. Um, to actually, uh, I suppose, the the recommend not the recommendation what i would actually like to see may actually be quite low bar which is the first would probably be just a recognition that human rights actually do apply i think the second might actually be a little bit still a low bar which is uh, uh that they would actually begin conversations on digital rights because i think conversations like um uh, surveillance are actually having their own even if they're in the private space and then even if they do have the jurisdiction they should actually not um, over surveil uh, employees and things like that. So I, I think those are actually uh, necessary for the businesses to actually ensure a healthy and trusted environment for for the people for their own people, and as they deliver these type of services to to others. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, I think the fact that, you know, the IOF um, is already engaging the government on these conversations is fantastic. It's a first step. Um, you know, we're obviously not there yet. There's still a lot more um, on the runway, but um, it, is an, it is a crucial first step. Um, I do think that companies are in an extremely unique position to be able to accelerate the progress in this space um, by you know, committing to human rights in general, but also business and human rights. Um, and so I think it's, um, you know, they have a unique opportunity to be able to bring this conversation further, faster. Um, but my one recommendation, um, and this is something that we hope will be 
uh, accomplished through the NEP is to ensure inclusive participation in these conversations. So making sure that, you know, at the table, we're not just seeing government, we're not just seeing NHRIs or business leaders, we're also seeing those people who are impacted um, by how businesses use our information or how businesses go about um, digital rights. Um, we also need to think more deeply about the kind of news um, of the digital space, right? It's not just, um, you know, the able-bodied person, but we're also thinking about people with disabilities. Um, we're thinking about indig indigenous communities, women, children, etc. So these are all things that we need to consider while we're having this conversation. Um, but I'm glad um, we're having it, um, and that's uh, a very positive first step. Thank you so much. Um, as we close off on that very encouraging, forward-looking um, note, I think I, I speak for all of us uh, when when I convey my gratitude to the IO Foundation for um, allowing us to have this platform and this conversation today. Um, and, and also to Jehan and the UNDP as you continue on and forge on towards 2023. I think, again, you can count on all of us for input and you know, our support in ensuring that Malaysia's National Action Plan is one that is progressive, inclusive, and also an opportunity to right systemic wrongs. I think one key takeaway that personally for me is that d digital rights come with digital responsibilities. And while it must absolutely be something that is um, enshrined and embedded in the technologies and also the regulations and the laws that we live within, um, it's also upon us to ensure that we exercise our rights in a, in a responsible way. And so I'd just like to close um, again by thanking our panelists, Javan, Farlina and Jehan um, and the IO Foundation. Thank you so much. And thank you, Navila, for the excellent moderation. Thank you so much. Um, we uh, this panel uh, is concluded, and we will move next to uh, to our next session. But I know some of you have to leave for your next uh, appointment. So, uh, on behalf of the IO Foundation and everyone here, thank you so much for your time and your knowledge. Okay, and uh, now we have a five minute break, and uh, we'll be back here in five minutes with uh, the next session is uh, national action plans around the world. Sorry, digital rights in national action plans around the world. So we will look at some examples of how digital rights have already been in some national action plans. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Five minutes.
Session soon. Session soon. Session soon. Uh, Session soon. Uh, uh. get the next uh, speaker uh, on on the stage Okay, we're waiting for Len to come online. Hi, oh, okay. can you hear me? Hello, Len. Oh, yeah, yes. I'm on the wrong side. Hi, Len. Hi, it's fine. I can't hear you. <laughs> Let me share. You can't hear ah, me? Okay, we see you. Now we need to now we need to now we need to now we need to You need to probably mute when I'm speaking and I'll... Yeah, you want me to start now? Just put your thumbs up. All right, <laughs> we can do this. Okay, so this is our first um, hybrid thing in the IO Foundation. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Nabila, for that really wonderful um, an impressive panel discussion. Um, congratulations, and and, and um, I think you know we've started a conversation in in this realm, and we're we're learning a lot from each other. So I am Len Manriquez, and I'm the IO Foundation's programs manager. I'm actually right now in the Philippines. Um, I would have loved to join you today, but because of you know, the never ending lockdown, I'm, I'm still stuck here. Nonetheless, I'm here with you virtually and I, I hope that I will be able to give you, you know, some um, substantial and clear information on the presence of digital rights um, in national action plans around the world. So probably let me, let me start with um, a brief uh, history, a brief background. Uh, let me know if my audio is not clear or if there's any problem with anything. You can just message me over the chat. What I could see is the uh, the chat function of Airmeet. Okay, so um, in June 2011, the Human Rights Council, the main United Nations body responsible for promotion and protection of human rights, endorsed the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Um, this move established the Guiding Principles as the global standards, you know, a global standard of practice that is now expected of all states and businesses. So maybe one thing that we need to remember, though, um, although this is the global standards that business and states could refer to, uh, it is not a binding commitment. Um, to, to all states. Um, however, the guiding principles outlines specific steps companies and states could take, you know, to conduct um, human rights due diligence um, in, in, in businesses. So the UNGP directs governments and businesses on three main pillars. Uh, I think Mariam has shared this with you earlier and Jehan as well. Um, the first pillar is the government's duty to protect. Um, the second pillar is the corporate responsibility to respect, and the third pillar is the access to remedy. So definitely, I mean, um, it is really the state's duty to protect its citizens um, from any human rights violations. And as um, businesses operate, operate their own you know, companies and, and commerce, um, they have that utmost duty to, to respect that human rights. And in events of... Um, uh, violations or in events that these human rights are not respected or protected, then there should be access to remedy. Although, as Jean and Mariam has emphasized, we hope, and it is our aim in the IO Foundation, that since the technological space is something we can, you know, um, you know, prevent harm from happening, there is actually, you know, less need to access remedy if if you don't need to access it in the first place because your rights are already observed from the beginning. Um, so the independent institution, the Danish Institute for Human Rights, manages the websites, uh, globalnaps.org, 
And this website collates and um, journals and records the developments of national action plans on business and human rights worldwide. Um, they are also providing you with information on which national action plans have been published or approved or passed in that um, in that specific country or state, and which action plans are actually at work right now in those specific country or state. And there are also states and countries that do not have uh, you know do not have work in relation to the NAPs, but actually have you know non-state initiatives so that principles in the UNGP on business and human rights are, are observed in those countries. Let me check um, for a while. Okay, all good. Um, so right now, there are 30 countries with business and human rights national action plans worldwide. And the first one that actually was able to publish its NAP was the United Kingdom in 2013. And they've updated this in 2016. And the latest, as Jehan mentioned, was Pakistan in September 2021. Uh, out another 15 countries are working on a national action plan, Malaysia included. And actually, Malaysia started to express its interest on developing a national action plan on business and human rights way back in 2015. And it, it has reaffirmed, you know, that interest in 2019. And this is how all these developments now on, on the national action plan in, on BHR is evolving and transforming in, in Malaysia. So I think it's been expressed um, very strongly in today's session and the sessions before this one, that there is really a um, a need, you know, for tech, comp for for tech, you know, to become a component of of a national action plan on business and human rights. So whether this is a specific theme or it's a cross cutting issue, you know, it's a it's it's an approach to that. But as to the necessity um, with the way we live our lives right now, in this time of our civilizations as human beings. <laughs> Um, there is really, you know, an obvious need for the inclusion of, of technology or um, regulation or policies involving the, uh, um, the, how do you call this, the, the respect, you know, or the promotion of human rights in that type of business, in the tech business. So um, on the existing NAPs, so as you, uh, or NAPs, um, as I've told you earlier, there are 30 of them. 16 of these national action plans have mention or have specific articles, specific um, indications on data privacy and protection. So there are 16 of that. And 15 have mention on ICT and the electronic sector. Um, I decided in the interest of time not to enumerate all those countries right now, but to give you six examples, you know, where these um, mentions happen and in which um, national action plans. Uh, but I think one important uh, thing that I'd like to point out in these numbers is that out of those 30, it's, you know, it's only 50% of, of those um, national action plans have actually considered, you know, um, putting in a thought or, or, or regulations or uh, advice as standards, you know, guidelines, commitments when it comes to, to information communications and technology and when it comes to data privacy and protection. And yeah, so most of the countries that did not were actually the countries who were first in, in publishing their national action plans. So as a few examples, let's look at the United States. So the United States are um, recognizes the importance and the impact of business conduct in the ICT sector. And um, their commitment is to work with other agencies and stakeholders to develop a kind of regular mechanism to identify, document, and publicize lessons learned and best practices when it comes to um, corporate actions, um, corporate meaning tech, um, that promote and protect human rights online. Or, or actually, this means that also other um, companies, not only tech, uh, when they use the digital space. Thailand, on the other hand, focuses on technology primarily in the context of labor. So the main concern of, of the Thai National Action Plan is when technology replaces labor. So what happens to, you know, to the person, to the working person in that sense? 
um, when when technology kind of uh, takes over the the manpower that I mean the job of that of that specific citizen. Uh, let me check on the chat. Okay, um, the. J- Japan, uh, Japanese National Action Plan actually is is one of the kind of models that we think is is going into the right direction. They've covered a lot of bases when it comes to ICT, when it comes to the internet, and when it comes to digital rights. So they've looked into um, freedom of expression. They've looked into um, requesting, you know, um, uh, deletion of information online. They've also, they're also looking into development of artificial intelligence. So in terms of being advanced, the Japanese national action plans in relation with, you know, technological components in the national action plan is actually one of the most, um, you know, forward looking when it comes to including a tech component. Finland, on the other hand, um, looks particularly on protection of privacy you know, in the electronics and communications sector. So the the main focus in how to ensure protection of privacy with authorities, I, ICT companies, and, and civil society. Um, my last two examples is Poland and the United Kingdom. So the Polish, Polish National Action Plan commits to draft a regulation to counteract restrictions on the freedom of speech. So they're also more focused on freedom of speech and the blockage of illegal content on the internet. And the United Kingdom, on the other hand, um, is looking into... um, This is actually quite interesting because this is somehow related to the work that we do in the IO Foundation. And one of the things that our founder and CEO, John Keralt, has always mentioned in, in many of the discourses that um, we could actually look at, you know, exportation of information within the context of import and export laws. You know, we could apply existing laws that apply that that is present in how we do business right now into how the information space or the digital space actually behaves in the digital environment. Um, so those are just uh, six countries um, examples um, that we could look at on the presence of some digital rights components in the existing national action plans around the world. Um, Mariam also mentioned this earlier, you know, uh, can can digital rights, you know, actually cut across different themes or parameters? It, it could. And we're looking at three thematic areas that are also quite the focus of the Malaysian national action plan. Um, labor, as we've mentioned already, uh, is not only about if tech replaces labor, but also how labor is implemented or practiced with um, with technology. Um, there's a lot of issues coming up right now in the gig economy. There's a lot of unfair treatment to workers online, and this has be this has to be looked at in the context not only of um, not only of labor per se, but about but specifically on digital rights. Because to be able to monitor how workers in digital space behave or conduct work there has to be some level of you know kind of some kind of digital surveillance that has to be in play to monitor that and that that needs to we need to ensure that that monitoring is you know strictly limited to work and also respects all other rights in relation to labor rights um and does not infringe on any other more um you know uh private or or information that is owned by that user um, on terms of the environment, you know, there's also a lot of, of, of things that we could look at, not only on the CO2 emissions of digital technologies, but also on how fast technology actually um, reduces its value and how much people need to buy new technology every so often just because you know, the lifespan of a device has not lasted anymore for 10 years, but is now usually ending in, in two years. I remember a time way back in 2005, 2008, that you could actually expect your laptop to last for at least five years. But right now, that just doesn't happen. You know, you you have your device and you could expect, you know, that your cell phone would only last for two years and then it's it's gone. It, it, you, you have to buy a new one. So that can be that the quality of that can be controlled and although that's the that's the how do you call it that's the hardware part of technology that's also something that needs to be you know that that could be covered within the digital rights um perspective 
And of course, good governance. Um, I think it was also mentioned in the session this morning about digital identities. How do we treat our digital identities or our digital twins? We are, I mean, I don't need to re-emphasize what has already been said, but those those um, representations of us in the digital space must have the same um, rights, must, must enjoy the same protection and the same respect in terms of rights wherever they exist in the in the online space. Yeah, okay, we have a comment there. Um, so uh, since we are celebrating uh, Data Privacy Day, I would like to narrow down our lens into the right to privacy and how present, where it is, is present in international human rights instruments. There are um, I'm, I'm pointing out four here right now. So the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, um, the International Co Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Convention on the Rights of the Child, and you know migrant workers' um, rights, protection of migrant workers' rights. So all of these um, international instruments have somehow, in one way or another, indicated some respect to the right of privacy. But one thing that we need to also remember is the fact that privacy is actually not, a, not an absolute right. It's not an absolute right. In, in some cases, um, if there are exemptions that is approved by law and reasonable you know, within the context of that country and has gone through all the necessary processes, uh, in terms of, of of policy building, there are some exemptions to the right of privacy, but I will I will not discuss that right now. What I actually wanted to point out, um, why I brought up this international human rights instruments, are the dates um, by when they were published, established, or or adopted uh, internationally and sent out to all different states that are you know signatories to these or members of the UN. I would like to relate these dates to the uses of the online space. So in 1995, there were only 44.4 million internet users. And as of last year, we are running 4.88 billion. There, there is some uh, level of, you know, in some way you could say that these laws need to be reviewed because they are not at par with the call of the times. They're kind of obsolete when it comes to, to dating. So there's really a need to, to revisit that. And I think the, the national action plans are an opportunity to upgrade these laws and to update you know, what's needed by the current society. So right now in developed countries, 90% of the population are actually using the internet. You know? So this, this is only on in developed countries. The, the UN Special Rapporteur on Right to Privacy in 2018 said that none of the major human rights treaties expressly include protection of personal information as an aspect of the right to privacy. Nonetheless, it is increasingly argued that the principles of data protection are incorporated within the broader right to privacy in these treaties. Um, I just like to mention that because that also relates very much into the fact that um, we need to really revisit. You need to really revisit what existing international human rights instruments are and how they relate to how the world functions right now, how we function right now as a, as a society. So in relation to Malaysia, um, we are in a very significant time um, because Malaysia is yet to develop a national action plan. It has the opportunity to include digital rights and recognize the growing role of information communications technology sector into the social, political, and economics economic lives of its citizens. Even countries in Europe with national action plans are lacking in this, in this area, and we have the opportunity to set the standards for BHR application in tech. If there is anything, if there's anything that we have learned or we need to learn from the COVID-19 pandemic, it is that people are beginning to realize how deeply integrated technology is in our daily lives. We are not just users, we are digital citizens. Um, this is the challenge that we that I would like to 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 leave to everyone um, today online and and on site um, that we need to claim we need to claim that right and we need to 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 claim our rights as digital citizens that we need to become not only the programmers are the next generation of human rights we need to support programmers to become the best next generation of human rights defenders. 
Um, that's all from me for this morning. And thank you, everyone. And I'm here if you have questions. Um, back to you, Mariam. Hello. Hello. Okay. Hello. 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 What happened? Hello. Yeah. I think that was pretty clear, Len. Oh, there we are. Okay. Yeah, that was pretty clear. Um, there is. Uh, a lot of responsibility for us now as more and more uh, as more as more digital acti activity is increasing and so we'll start seeing a lot of um, threats and vulnerabilities and and um, we'll start seeing uh, cyber security issues increasing precisely because activity is increasing so it's no longer enough to just look at the 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 percentage of um, um, how do you say uh, threats to digital rights happening, but also where and how exactly those those threats or those harms are happening. Because uh, the, the the increase in, in digital rights violations is, it could be a correlation to the increase in internet or digital activities, not necessarily because of other motivations. But anyway, that's on a different topic. But uh, what we can say for sure is that national action plans around the world are looking into uh, digital rights uh, slowly but surely and um, even if uh, we even if the, the, the countries that are developing uh, their national action plans right now don't include digital rights at this point at some point you know later down the road in the future they may actually have to do it anyway because it's, it's happening <laughs> we are not just users uh, as, as, uh, as was mentioned we are digital citizens um, okay, no comments? Any thoughts? <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you so much, Len. Len, you still there? Not sure. We will go to our next session, uh, which is a roundtable discussion, basically a five-minute introduction. Uh, this will be facilitated by uh, Jean. Um, and we have two questions for the audience, basically for us to brainstorm for and to kind of... Uh, feedback of each other and so thank uh i would like to invite john to the stage to facilitate the next session yes so okay. we thank are you. going to request a little bit of patience for our online audience because we're going to be changing the disposition of the camera uh we're just going to be cutting the the feed for just about 30 seconds until we just move it and get back to you and i would um yeah i think actually separation is going to be good so i'm going to be putting the camera a little bit further. all right so um can you please Wait, okay. Inconveniences of not having more than one camera. No, you have to probably go a little bit further. I'm suspecting. Yeah, have a quick look. Maybe tilt down. Hmm. Yeah, the angle is going to be complicated. Would it be any possibility to... Hmm. Okay, we do our best. The angle, the angle is, not, is not the best one, so it is, it is what it is. Yeah, it's okay. Let's not waste too much time on, on this. The importance is to, to get the session rolling. Very good. Okay. All right. So let me also put the questions on the screen. So what we're going to be doing now is a workshop. Uh, yay. That was Len here. So we're going to be exploring a little bit of um, some of the questions that have to do with uh, um, what we were discussing on the National Action Plan and the difference between having it as a thematic area and a cross-cutting um, um, cross issue. Is it the right term? Okay. So um, 
first, first, does everyone understand exactly what do we mean by thematic area? No? Okay, so thematic area would be what are the main core topics that have to be discussed in a national action plan? And they have to be kind of unique and sort of on their own right to be something that is a topic that describes itself. A cross-cutting issue is one specific concept that cross-cuts each of one of them that on its own virtue does not deserve to be a whole thematic area. However, it influences each of one of the exposed thematic areas on that map and therefore deserves to be mentioned. So for instance, you could make the case that technology in itself is such a big thing uh, in our lives that it deserves to be looked into it as a specific problem in itself. Or you could make the case, as Lynn was mentioning before, each of one of the three thematic areas that I consider in Malaysia in this case do have components that relate to technology. And as such, they will be treated as side elements of those thematic areas. Does that make any sense? So the question is, what do you think? Is tech relevant enough to deserve its own thematic area? Or would it be best served to be considered as a subpart of the other ones? And again, it was uh, good governance, um, labor, and um, environment. environment. What do you guys think? Do you have the microphones around? Does anyone wants to participate? Can you hear me? Yeah, so uh, my personal... Please, please introduce yourself first. We forgot to do that before. Okay, uh, my name is Joe Gais. Uh, I'm currently working in digital and cybersecurity space, uh, helping SMEs currently to achieve their goals and uh, growth, uh, which is actually the requirement right now in COVID-19 requirement. Uh, now, coming to the question, uh, uh, with my technology experience, I can say that we cannot see technology in isolation. Uh, Lots of organizations uh, from where I come from, or what I've seen and consulted, have uh, done this mistake of looking at technology in isolation. Technology is very much enabler, and uh, in this regard, it has to be seen as a cross cut. So, when you say labor, governance, and the last one, uh, it has to have its own segment into that. So, it has to have a cross cut rather than looking in isolation. I'll give an example of GDPR, right? Uh, it was written probably by people who might not be a technology guy, right? I, I'll give an example of cookie policy. Uh, you need to have a banner out there on the website, but if you go, I mean, if you lower interpret the GDPR, it is that even if the user will scroll, you can take as a consent, but most of the people will scroll even before reading or doing something. So what actually we are trying to achieve with that. So that is a kind of, you know, loophole, I will say that. So uh, that is, doesn't make any sense. So similarly, if you put technology uh, as in isolation, it won't have any meaning at all, right? So that's where uh, technology is an enabler to achieve what you want to achieve and achieve it in a systematic manner and also with the evidence. And everybody can look, have a look at it. You can put in public. Uh, we are talking about medicine action plan, then of course uh, it has to be thoroughly reviewed, what is being promised, what is being done. So that's where I see that technology has to be cross-cutting in, in those thematic areas. Yeah. Okay, so I have a follow-up on, on that. So th your, your point, uh, correct me if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm wrong as to how I got it, is that technology influences and is um, tightly connected to each of one of those areas as to be considered a separate entity um, on itself. Uh, as in, you see it as an enabling tool, as an enabling platform, as an enabling system for all of those elements of labor, good governments, etc. not as a separate entity. So my question would be, when does it become an actual separate entity? Because if you think about the increasing, um, um, what's the English? Um, pervasiveness of technology in our lives, 
and how much we are shifting into basically having a much more active online life. Let's say, again, go back to the uh, uh, damn metaverses. W when, when does that become, when, when is the line crossed? Because you, 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 you can make the case that environment is separate from labor, but to a certain degree, they actually have an overlapping part. And good governance affects all of them uh, in general. So good governance is what determines the laws for environment protection. And uh, the same goes for labor. The governments that, that get, get to regulate that. So you could make the case that it's a subgroup of a subgroup. But there's a point where you decide, well, governance has crossed the line where it can be a concept on its own, and so does labor, and so does environment. So the question that I ask myself is, when does technology cross that line to be so important in your life that it doesn't become an enabler for everything, but it is actually its own thing? Am I making sense of my question? Let me try to digest. Okay. Uh, so you're asking if uh, technology has its own different thematic, thematic areas, right, uh, in addition to these three. Mm. Uh, I think we have to go back to the what we are trying to achieve in terms of uh, uh, doing this, right? Uh, it ultimately will boil down to, I always see technology as an enabler. Of course, it is at the forefront of what we are trying to do, but the basics remain the same, right? Um, uh, I'll take the example of the uh, fintech, right? Fintech. Uh, I may be diverting a little bit from the topic because that's my expertise. I'll t talk about the fintech. I mean, we say that fintech is something new, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But ultimately, finance plus technology has become as enabler to put everything online, and that's where it has become finance plus technology is fintech, and lots of ecosystem going around that. But technology is always going to be enabler for you to do something which you can. But ultimately, uh, the problem we are trying to solve is that in those thematic thematic areas, technology is being misused. Right. Uh, I'll take example of uh, uh, the last social media corporates. Right. They are uh, using technology, uh, data, and all, and they are violating all those basic principles out there. And that's where I believe that technology is having a part in all those thematic areas rather than uh, keeping it separate. Because once again, if you try to look at it uh, as an isolation, you won't be solving those specific. A problem which you are trying to solve, and it will become a policy, a pamphlet, or whatever it is in isolation, and it will be a large job to do. And uh, as a technology guy, I also won't know what it is trying to solve, and uh, the lawyers will interpret differently. Ultimately, it we will have the same problem that we have right now. That's that's my opinion on that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Jihan would like. To... Thanks. Hello. And I actually realized I wasn't on the frame, so I'm just going to put <laughs> myself here. Um, so, right. so thanks for the, uh, the, the question. Um, I, I think this is definitely an interesting one because it, you know, how we contextualize um, what digital rights means within the context of um, the NAP means, you know, has an impact on who, you know, which stakeholders are being brought to the table. Um, how far the scope of the conversation will go, um, et cetera. But if I can give an example, um, this is an actual conversation that we had um, when the government had put forward the proposal for the three thematic areas. Um, a lot of people had a question about, how about gender? Gender is such a you know, pervasive issue. Um, uh, it should set itself up as its own thematic area. Um, but after um, a lot of discussion, um, in the way that the NAP would be structured, um, we found that gender would then come anyway under each of um, sort of the bubbles um, that were proposed. So, you know, there will be issues related to business and human rights for women, um, for women workers. Um, there will be issues for human rights um, for indigenous women, um, you know, as, as um, they are impacted by you know, factories open, opening up in their villages. Um, and the same goes for governance. Um, you know, things like anti-discrimination, all of this comes into play. So I think the same sort of uh, way of thinking should be applied for digital rights because it is, because it's, it is so pervasive, um, it will naturally 
um, be part of all the conversations that we'll be having about uh, business and human rights. But on that point, I also wanted to add, um, so this year is a big year because um, we are hoping to conduct um, the, the national based on assessment. So this is, you know, um, national level, we're, we're looking at Peninsula Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak. Um, and this will really be the, the activity that will start looking into evaluating um, key business and human rights issues. Um, so we're hoping that through this exercise, um, we'll have more information about how digital rights has or has not impacted communities, um, who are some of um, those that uh, are involved um, in this conversation, um, and, also, and of course the scope. So, so I think those are just some things that um, you know I wanted to comment on, um, but that I think the the baseline assessment will be a great opportunity to for us to learn more about you know digital rights and its role in the MEP. Yes. Oh. Allow me to pass the microphone and I guess please introduce yourself before. Thank you. Um, hello. So, hello, my name is Isat Chung. Um, a little bit about the tech in the NAP and, and addressing the thematic areas. Um, I find it probably quite problematic if we want to really depend on tech to say address good governance issues if there's no um, a basis or underlying uh, factor that exists in the first place. For example, um, for good governance issues, say, to combat corruption, in this region, not just Malaysia, we don't have, say, uh, lobbying law or lobbying data collected. We don't have, in Malaysia, political finance collected. So if we don't have these things in the first place, it's very hard, say, to implement tech as a means of addressing the goals. And even, say, in the issue of environment, for example, Malaysia's submission of their greenhouse gases emission to the UNFCC, the verification of that data, as well as the other countries' data, are not transparent, and it's only between the country and the UN officials. So I, I find it hard where TEP uh, is able to, to facilitate that. And say, even in uh, the... The issue of labor, for example, yes, there's an there's issue of uh, uh, workers in the digital space. However, I see it more that we're trying to solve a social issue rather than a tech issue. And probably in the first place, if a country does not have a, a strong enough labor law or a, a culture of a strong enough labor union, probably we need to prioritize that. And then I see the tech as a supplement. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, um, anyone wants to pitch in? Uh, I'm actually uh, um, uh, wondering, Isaac, um, can you actually control the position of the camera as we move around so that, you know, people get into the frame, even if we have to, you know, doing, okay, perfect. Really? Does it show right now for, for him when he was talking? Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Thank you for all of those um, inputs. Um, um, yes, Mariam, you want to pitch in? Yeah, I just want to um, say a little bit about um, uh, technological solutionism that was mentioned by Yogesh and Isad. Um, I, I agree. All these problems uh, before technology, you know, digital technology, I mean, um, is even in our lives, all these social issues have already existed. And as COVID has shown us, te uh, technology actually amplifies uh, social inequality and that are already existing before. So they basically just put, sort of put all these social issues on a magnifying glass and then just blow it out and scale it up to, 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 a, to bigger proportions, essentially. Um, and, that, and that is very true. Uh, which also actually leads to how uh, technology also holds the potential to solve the same issues. Uh, the, same, the, the thing about technology, especially digital technologies, is that the ability to scale, not just problems, <laughs> but also solutions. Uh, the thing, you know, the things that we used to only be able to do on one device, we can now do in multiple devices. And then the things that you used to only reach like uh, one kampong can literally reach the whole city. 
the question now, and this is where I really love, I'm so sorry, Jehan, you're behind me. Um, this is where I really love to always quote Francesca Bria. She is like my, you know, my guru in this, uh, in this, in this uh, tech policy uh, universe. She was the chief technology officer of the Barcelona City Council uh, for their smart city program. And she always says this, your technology is only a tool. You decide first what kind of world you want to live in, what kind of city you want to live in, in the context of smart city. And then you deploy and, you, sorry, and then you figure out the technology and the tools that you want to do it. So in the context of Barcelona, First of all, they decided this is going to be a democratic city. So how do you ensure democracy in a smart city program? One key principle was all the data is owned by the data owners, us. Because every data comes from us. We are the raw material in the digital world. We, ourselves, become digitalized and digital you know, digitally transform to exist in another world, right? In a, in a digital world. But it's still us. So that relation is protected under that political paradigm. Francesca always says that technology is serves, sorry, technology serves a political function. And what if, 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 if you have a, a democratic government, technology will be used for democratic purposes. If you have an authoritarian government, you, your technology will be used for authoritarian purposes. <laughs> so technology in this sense is neutral. It's the humans that decide where does the, the, the uh, technology um, you know, go to in terms of like uh, function. So yeah, I just wanted to add that because that, that, that paradigm alone right, changed the way that technology is deployed in a smart city program because there are smart city programs and smart cities uh, systems designed not based on that. Like you don't own your data. For example, like how we look at uh, my Sejatra is one, one, one common example for all of us, right? Do we even know where the data goes? <laughs> in, yeah, like exactly. So, um, so how it works in, in, when I look at the system, in, uh, the one that Francesca designed with her team. Um, so you, if you are a city, a resident, not a city, yeah, a citizen, yeah. If you are a resident of Barcelona, you have this thing on, you know, uh, on your phone, and you get to decide where your data goes. Let's say you want your data to go to the hospital, but you don't want it to go to the police station, for example. So you decide where your data goes to, and who gets access to your data. If you want to revoke it, you revoke it. It sounds simple enough. <laughs> Right? Because governments and city councils do need data because they use that data in order to figure out where which part of the city needs fixing, have problems that need fixing. Those data is good. I want the city council to have my data. Like, for example, if, if it means that it will fix certain traffic lights or it will fix certain potholes, that's fine. But I don't want, for example, um, I don't know, the... <laughs> I don't know, can you give me an example? I don't know, the police station, whatever, nowhere, label. I don't know. It's, it, whatever, whatever the is, it's valid. All data should be private by default. Yeah, so that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, Marion, for, for the comments. I, I can imagine other circumstances where um, there are legit situations for authorities to have access to data that otherwise would consider um, private. And that's always a very thorny conversation on, on itself. I wanted to, to go back to um, the previous um, comments, just to throw a little bit of um, food for thought. Maybe one of the main differences while we're looking at things a little bit different is because I keep concentrating myself, and that's also because it's the advocacy of the organization, to look into not the humans themselves, but actually the data that represents them. And I actually look at that data as an entity itself. And so when, when I'm thinking about labor, I'm not thinking about the labor of the human. I'm thinking about the labor generated by the data. And I'm not looking at it from the perspective of, oh, if I give access to my data, Facebook is going to be giving me some money back. I'm not thinking about that. I'm going to give you a counter example, a parallel example. You might see exactly where I'm coming. Some of us have Apple products. Some of us have Amazon products, Echoes and, and Alexas and so forth in, in our houses. 
both Siri and Alexa are essentially the salesperson of those companies. They are the embodiment of a digital twin of those companies. I mean, it's, it's kind of crude to, to look at it that way, but basically they obtain a lot of information and they present a number of, uh, of uh, uh, results. For instance, Alexa, give me the, uh, I need to go buy tomatoes. Where can I buy tomatoes? The results that they are providing to you are skewed by their own business model. It's not necessarily the one that you want or the one that is going to be a, a profitable for you. It's the one that is profitable for them. Okay? They are generating labor for Apple and for Amazon. Okay? That's a piece of software that has a specific algorithm that you can sort of equip uh, uh, um, uh, it with having a personality, even if it's a very basic one. But it is making decisions based on information, based on its environment, to try to provide you with something that they believe is their objective, their business model, in other words. Okay? So when Facebook has my information, the way I look at it is that it's, it's, it's my information that is doing labor that should be rewarded about. It's not about them having my information. I'm not selling the information itself. It's the labor that it generates, the gain, the benefit that it generates. And so I'm always thinking about, I made a presentation about this on, on RiceCon in 2018, 2019. What was RiceCon Tunis? I can't remember. 2019, possibly? Yeah. So I made a very short landing talk on um, what I call uh, emotional firewalls. And it's a very fancy word that I put together just to express the fact that when you have this kind of personal assistance with you, they are essentially the salesperson of a third party. And the information they're providing to you that are not necessarily the most interesting for you is essentially they learn how to press your emotional buttons to be able to trigger a specific response, whether it is a consumer response, whether it is a political change response or any of the different responses that we are always so much concerned about. In order for you to protect yourself, you would want to have your own personal assistant that is running on your own device that is doing that job for you. And what does that become when that personal assistant learns enough about you to know exactly the kind of things that you like? It becomes you. To a lesser degree, to a very imperfect degree, fair enough. But it is acting upon you and doing the labor for you of those researchers. Or let's say, hey, I'm publishing an article with UNDP, you know, and they owe me money. Instead of me going, my personal assistant goes and talks to them, manages the, 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 the finishing of the contract, and gets the money back. That's labor. You see where I'm trying to go with this? The moment that our digital twins get to have enough relevance in the space, they're going to have just as much considerations as we do from a human perspective of labor, environment. Environment is, where do they exist? So it's, it, it starts... That was the question that I was asking before. Where is the line when things have you know, the traditional part, but it's a tool, it's an enabler, and when does it become an entity on itself that is so relevant and does have an existence that we have to start caring about it from a much more broader perspective because it's not enough to look at it from a human perspective anymore. Knowing that, you know, again, I'm just going to end up leaving my you know, conspiracy theories uh, lately are very hot on this. You're going to be living on your pod eating insects and just plug to the matrix, and you're going to be living in a virtual reality. Conspiracy theory, okay? But think about how more often than not, those thoughts that we, I mean, 20 years ago, no one would have imagined that we're going to have the, the, the bloody power that we have in our smartphones now. Okay? And how does that have changed our perception of, uh, of reality in our daily lives? I keep arguing that we are not the people anymore. We are the cyborgs. And I keep asking, I keep always throwing the same challenge. If you think that I'm overreaching here, that I'm just exaggerating, please give me your smartphone and we have this conversation again in one week time. Okay? It has become an absolute extension of us. So if I care about my limbs, probably I also want to care in the same degree about my technical devices. So apparently I'm just being told that we have only five minutes left for a thing. I might try to go to the second question. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to get there. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? So, uh, I think.
think uh, we have encircled the thought of uh, the question which he asked. I just like to add that, see, uh, we have to, if we are trying to answer to that question, we have to go with the flow chart, okay? So flow chart says that the problem it is coming because of technology, right? Is technology required in the world? I make my living. Yeah. So, is it required, right? Now, as speaking about the national stuff, right? And that's the exact answer to. Sorry, sorry for that. Yeah, so in case of Barcelona, right, if you're trying to solve that same issue with the very generic or uh, standard issue, that is, then there is not going to be a, a cyber uh, smart city ever. So that's why uh, these cross function technology has to be part of that discussion. And also, if you're trying to solve with isolation, it, is, it also stops the innovation. You know? I'll give an example of a, of a, a traditional way. You cannot impose same regulations to a startup companies. Just, that's why government is trying to uh, kind of be lean, lean, lean uh, uh, with those regulations. The same analogy has to apply to that. When the problem bigger, uh, becomes much bigger, you try to solve it with, with, with that particular specific issue rather than trying to impose a very generic one. Like, like a GDPR, I always go back to the, the same, which is like, you know, Every time a small uh, uh, website comes up, they, they go back to GDPR. But GDPR has made their life so tough, the innovation might go away. And that's why you have to have the right balance. And in my humble opinion, the right balance can be only when we try to use technology as part of the issues which we are trying to solve rather than keeping it as a standard isolation that will in, uh, hamper the innovation and uh, try to put so many things which that's what we're doing here. We have a second question. Um, you have it on the on the screen, Isaac. You can use the slides on my laptop. There you go. So, assuming that this is happening, which apparently is happening, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not putting Jehan on a very bad spot here. How do we imagine the process of adoption? So, let's imagine a, a, a utopian or idealistic situation where that, uh, whether it is an actual area or um, cross-cutting issue, what would be the adoption process for the National Action Plan for, for the tech industry. And I think Jehan is possibly better uh, positioned here. I know I'm you're busy over there, but uh, it, it, you probably have the best um, um, angle right now at the moment to be able to, to give us a guidance on how this could look like. Um, so I think when it comes to adoption um, by, I mean, not just the tech industry or really any any sector, um, you know, uh, I think the maybe one thing or the main thing that works is incentives. Um, so the NAP needs to consider how they can incentivize sectors like the tech sector to come on board um, and make sure that human rights is um, an agenda um, that is a priority for these companies. Um, how how in, how enforce how enforceable is the NAP going to be in terms of um, you know that's a good yeah that's a good question um, so Len mentioned earlier that you know this this is a legal document in any way um, and if we look at other national action plans so for example um, there is a national action plan on forced labor that. Uh, was launched. So I think the, the latest version was launched um, in December. Um, a lot of this has to has to work around the idea of volu voluntary um, change. Um, 
so there really isn't sort of that um, legal regulation around enforcing uh, these ideas that will be covered in the, uh, the NAP. Um, however, with, you know, a, a smart mix of measures um, that include voluntary measures, but also uh, mandatory measures. So for example, we can look at specific regulation like human rights due diligence. Um, so getting companies on board um, on human rights due diligence is one way that we can ensure that uh, companies are well socialized on the issue, um, but they, they can take part in um, that conversation um, and action. Okay, so you... So possibly the conversation at that point in terms of, uh, of adoption goes more on the side of the value propositions that can be provided. Yeah, the and business case. Correct. And mm -hmm. likely on some sort of de-risking um, in terms of, you know, observance of other regulations and maybe savings on the bottom line, essentially, as in, you know, companies basically bottom line is to make money. So Of course, yeah. Okay, so if there's any of those elements that can be sold, by sold, I mean, <laughs> express and, yeah, sold, it's an idea. Um, uh, for them to minimize costs, do you think that would be also? I mean, I mean that's one way to do it. Um, another part um, is, you know, trying to leverage uh, market shifts. Um, so at the moment, we're really looking, um, you know, we're really seeing a lot of movement uh, with uh, the ESG framework. Um, so companies are starting to look more seriously at ESG, especially the, the social part um, in ESG, um, because uh, consumer demand is changing um, and markets are changing. And, and um, you know, the way regional markets are also changing. So that will have an effect and an impact um, on Malaysia. Um, so, you know, we're, we're sort of in that middle point where we're definitely leaving a space where, you know, these things, you know, what we used to consider, you know, BHR, before it was BHR, was CSR, right? And we, we would think of this as something that was nice to have, but it wasn't really compulsory. But this is in human rights is really looking to normalize and socialize it in such a way that you cannot not think about it for your bottom line. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the direction we're heading in now anyway. So you either come on board or you get left behind. And so and from, a, um, from an educational pipeline perspective, do you think that also plays a role for that adoption? As in, if you start training and making people understand about BHR in the coming years, likely in 10 years from now, once those, um, I don't know how to use the expression, basically people who end up being in management positions who can at some point take the, uh, the decision making process and, and, and influence how an organization is, is then adopting much more observance of BHR. Do you see that as, as a long-term yeah. uh, plan, if you will? I mean, it's, it's you know, uh, uh, there should be a nice balance of carrot and stick. So carrot would be, Let's provide, um, you know, let's the, let the government provide free, or even the other way around, um, companies to provide training to government officers um, on digital rights, like what it, what it is, essentially. Um, you know, sort of just basic capacity building. Um, and, you know, a, a stick, for example, could be like what we see in the labor space. Um, we're, look, we're seeing countries that are... Uh, banning imports from Malaysia because um, you know, there is uh, proof of um, forced labor um, activities that are happening. And, and so there needs, you know, I think like, for example, with a mix of let's do this together, let's be able, you know, let's build capacity of officers, um, let's get this conversation going, making sure that people are thinking about it on a daily basis together with you know, more punitive measures um, that we can sort of bring all of that together in a way that accelerates um, the progress. Okay. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, anyone else would like to make any comment? Because I believe we are a little bit on top of the time. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, I don't want to repeat what Jehan already said. Um, 
the legislation side of things would definitely be um, something for the expertise of lawyers and legislators and lawmakers and things like that. Um, but I'm just more concerned on the technological side of things, how, they gonna, uh, how things are going to be implemented technically. And since we don't really have a picture of how that is going to look like um, before, I don't know if there have been cities or uh, uh, global examples everywhere, uh, anywhere else. Um, definitely going to need some research on that. But I would see that definitely as something that is uh, of innovation because innovation is not just technology. Social policies also need to innovate at the same time. And yeah, <laughs> like we always think of innovation as only tech, right? But actually, society also innovates in their own way. Yeah. Yeah, innovation is a thought process that gets Correct. materialized in a specific technology or in a specific social change yep. with the thought process. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to be calling this session as well to a close. I would like to remind a little bit, uh, kind of recap, why did we have this session? So the whole topic of today was Data Privacy Day. And we may not have been mentioning the word privacy that much, but it was, in fact, very much uh, embedded into anything that we've been discussing. Because privacy is determined about how much information they know about you. Okay, so all we've been discussing has been how to try to improve um, uh, technology protection for um, for users, for citizens. We actually prefer to call them citizens than, than users. Users is kind of a again a very detached type of uh, uh, of word, and I rather think that citizens um, express as much better what they are. Uh, and possibly makes us care about them a little bit more. Um, and so the importance of protecting that data is the means by which you're going to be protecting their privacy. Um, Mariam, you want to join me on some last words before we close the, the close up? Here's the camera. Oh, you can probably be in. She's in the frame, right? <laughs> Mariam is in the frame. OK. Well, I, I guess, yeah. Um... Since we do this every year, right, uh, celebrating Data Privacy Day, I, I kind of hope that um, next year we're going to see something really more concrete, uh, something to actually celebrate with. <laughs> because right now we're celebrating a concept rather than a reality, you know what I mean? So <laughs> um, even, if, even if we do somehow, uh, you know, have data privacy in in, in, in in our real lives, at some point, I don't think it's barely even anything enough and compared to what's coming towards us. Uh, more and more immersive technologies are coming and we might not even be living in this world much as much as we live in, you know, the matrix. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, yeah, what's the next one year going to be like for data privacy? And, and then also, I'm also thinking, like, what's the next five years going to be like with data privacy? And, and since everybody's throwing around the word metaverse, is there even privacy there in that world if there's no privacy here? You know? So, and thank you so much, everyone, for your participation. And, uh, uh, oh. You, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. By all means. Uh, we use the microphone for the online audience. Uh, it, it's for the online audience, uh, Mr. Yep. Yeah, well, Europe is... Yeah, so the question is, what is... Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the question is, uh, if I could speak a little bit about what is the privacy concept or how it is implemented when it comes to uh, my place of origin. So I, I, I was originally born and raised in Spain, even though my passport is French. So if you're going to be checking me uh, online, you're going to find that contradiction uh, before anyone just jumps. Um, so I'm going to go back to what I was mentioning before, sort of a matter of, of ethics. So it has to do with culture. And so when you 
see the difference on how Malaysians, for instance, may treat pri uh, um, private information on how they, may, they may not be minding so much on uh, sharing data that otherwise would have been considered as very private in, in, in Europe. It has to do with um, a historical perspective, but also on that cultural element. And so it's, it's no surprise that Europe was the first one who came up with the most stringent data protection law in the world. Because there is history behind it that tells you, you know, the French Revolution, the World War I, et cetera, et cetera, where um, there's been a development on the understanding of privacy, essentially because To put, to put it blindly, enough people died out of it, okay? Um, make no mistake, the only reason why we have a, a universal declaration of human rights is because we had an holocaust and we bombed uh, the hell out of two Japanese cities. That's basically it. So for as long as it kills enough people, we start caring. It's kind of one of the failures of human uh, mentality. So in Europe, all of those problems did exist. And there's been a very interesting um, social um, perception that privacy matters. It's kind of the core of, uh, 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 of GDPR, even though it doesn't really serve the purpose. I mean, that's a whole conversation and possibly Yogesh could give us a lot of uh, much more insights on, on, on it because it's one of his areas of, uh, of work. Now, you know, you don't really care about how polluted the environment is until you don't end up in the hospital. Until then, it's a very ethereal concept that doesn't really touch you much, or until your parents end up in the hospital. Um, it keeps me awake at night to keep thinking what is the digital equivalent of the Holocaust, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki. I still don't have an answer to that question. But what will it take for people to actually start flipping and care so much worldwide about how their data is being used, I still don't know exactly what is going to be taken. Because right now, data leaks, for instance, are way too normalized. I don't care anymore. Uh, you know, have you been pawned? Sends me a, uh, uh, an email. Oh, this database, I mean, okay, whatever. Another day under the sun. What's going to be the game changer in the digital space for us to start caring? I don't have an answer to that. It really bothers me. Because I wonder if we haven't reached the point of no return. I, again, I don't have an answer for that. But it really feels that the evolution of technology in the hands of private, uh, uh, private corporations that are not necessarily accountable to governments, and like it or not, governments do still have at least democratic systems. They do have ways for you to influence. You cannot do that with a corporation. I mean, that nonsensical thing about, you know, have shares and vote in the next, no, nah, no, nah, that, that, that's just for a minority, not, not, not for the general public. And so I don't know what will be that particular um, game changer, but it has to be. And those game changes can be local. I mean, maybe something happens in Malaysia that all of a sudden makes people you know, go react and they start requesting for the data protection commissioner to have much more uh, clear rules and you know, uh, uh, update PDPA and make it much more enforceable, for instance. Maybe. And that doesn't mean that talent is going to follow suit because maybe they don't see that as a problem for, for themselves. But there has to be some type of change. And unfortunately, there has to be a sufficient degree of suffering from a sufficient amount of people for the change to happen. And, you know, sometimes I would really love that we are a bit more proactive than that so we can try to avoid the problem before it happens. But it's, it's, it's human nature. And I don't want to end up this on a grim note. Hello. Um, yeah, I wanted to thank everyone for, for coming. It was great having you. Thanks a lot for daring to actually have uh, a first in-person event. We had no idea how this was going to play out. We were pretty much aware about the difficulties, how people are still reticent to do, and for good reasons. I mean, we don't criticize that at all. Um, also, thank you a lot for uh, our online audience, for the participation, and for some of the questions that we didn't manage to, uh, to answer. 
Um, for all of you who are online, we're going to be now going, that's a good thing about being in physical, we're going to be having lunch together, but you have the, pot to the possibility of having a networking session online. We also recommend you to have a look at the booths where you're going to find some organizations and some projects that you may want to support. Have a look at it. TechUp is officially open today, uh, moving forward for the rest of uh, 2022. We're going to be having a number of other activities like this, some of them purely online, others we will try to increase the hybrid presence because you know it's, it's good to be interacting face-to-face uh, um, -face and try to regain a bit of sense of normality or whatever, whatever that means nowadays. Um, and uh, we're going to be running uh, a set of other um, activities such as uh, automation labs and so forth. We're going to be keep pairing open source projects with volunteers. Uh, and have much more as well capacity building sessions. So we'll be keeping you uh, updated on this. And again, thanks everyone for coming and I hope you had an enjoyable uh, morning and I hope the food is even better than the, than the whole thing. Thank you. True, it was just been mentioned, happy Chinese New Year in advance. <laughs>